Good morning. We are live from City Hall Chamber. Staying around for a bit, right? All right, good morning, everyone. I would like to call this uh, meeting to order. Uh, I will do, at this time, I would like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and acknowledge the diverse ind indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nakora Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, now settlers from around the world. Uh, roll call. I will start on this side. Councillor Wright. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Stevenson will be joining us around 10.30. She's representing uh, City at an announcement in downtown. And uh, Councillor uh, Paquette will also be joining us a little later on. He has a, a personal appointment. Uh, and uh, Councillor Tang. Good morning. I'm here. Councillor Hamilton. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. Councillor Salvador. Good morning. Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor Reyes. Good morning. And Councillor Jans. Good morning. All right, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Hamilton. I'll move that the January 31st, 2023 City Council meeting agenda be adopted with the following change, the addition of item 9.1, Labor Relations Update. Okay, second. thank you. Second by, was this a, Councillor Rice, second to that? Councillor Rice, second, please vote. I mean, yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, for me. Thank you, Councillor Tang. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Approval of the minutes. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'll move the approval of the minutes from the City Council budget, uh, November 30th, December 1st, 2nd, 7th, 9th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 2022 City Council meeting the December 5th, 2022 City Council meeting and the December 6th, 2022 City Council public hearing. Need a seconder. Second. Councillor Wright seconded that. Before we vote, I just want to uh, acknowledge the, uh, the work of uh, the City Clerk's office. Uh, you, when you look at the, uh, the pages, number of minutes that they captured, they had to go through them all numerous times there are 280 pages of minutes through the of the budget process uh, they listened over and over again to our voices i don't know how pleasant that was i'm pretty sure it wasn't that pleasant right but uh, they did that and uh, they really need to be uh, commended for uh, for their work so on behalf of city council i just want to thank each and every one of you for working so hard during the budget process but also spending hours and hours and hours of your time after the budget to making sure all the minutes were accurately captured so on behalf of all of us thank you so much and andre uh, you want to add a few words yeah Yes, thank you very much, Mayor Sohi and Council. I just want to reiterate our, our thanks to our, our clerk's office. They, 
uh, the work that they have done really brings the culmination of everything the city presents to council and to the public, and it's all done uh, based on all their efforts. Um, and if there were if there were ever a service that was, um, I would say, core and public facing and front line, it's it's the clerks who have to who, who did such a great job of also welcoming the public to chambers during yeah. the over 200 folks who who came to speak to uh, to uh, council. And I, I was just uh, reflecting on uh, the role of the clerk actually goes, and the clerk's office goes all the way back to ancient Greece. Uh, and even before uh, we were writing words, uh, they used to refer to clerks as the remembrancers. And the public record was actually buried in the memory of uh, these people who served this, th that was their role. Their role was to be the public uh, record by remembering what was said in, in uh, early governments. It goes all the way back to ancient Greece right before uh, writing. So that's what they do now. They are the remembrancers for, for the Edmonton public and uh, they've done such an amazing job. So just wanna thank them and add my thanks. Well done. Yeah, absolutely. Good. All right, any errors or omissions in the minutes? <laughs> All right, seeing none, please vote. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, protocol items. I have a quick one. We are here uh, in the chamber joined by uh, grade six class from St. Kateri with their teacher, Ashley Malkin, right? And they are represented by Councillor Wright, Ward uh, Spimitapi. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, are you, uh, are you here for the whole day or are you part of the week long uh, city school? Oh, right on. Okay, we'll see you around then in the, uh, uh, in the in the in the in the main foyer and uh, around your uh, activities in the in the city hall. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're having fun. Are you enjoying yourself? Right on. Okay, we'll see you around. Uh, that's protocol items. Items for discussion and related business. Select items for debate. All right, select items for debate. Councillor Rutherford. I'm gonna select 8.2. I don't have debate about the bylaw, but I do have a subsequent. Okay, 8.2. Thank you. Councillor Wright. I'll select 7.3, please. 7.3. Uh, so on 7.3, Councillor Wright, just wanna know, because this was at the at the committee, you, are you selecting for voting purposes or you have any subsequent or you have questions? Um, I have some additional questions for administration from a, a memo that they provided to us. Okay, got it. So uh, questions arising out of new information that was received by council through a memo. The reason I'm asking is that I just wanna encourage each and every one of us to uh, uh, when reports are at a committee that we try to ask all of our questions at committees, even for non-committee members, because that's the venue. And if you're unable to attend, you can always go back and listen to the debate, right? This council's role is more about, you know, delegating that to the committees and having that good discussion at the committee and here for voting purposes or debate, right? So thank you so much, but this, because new information came out after the committee, so it's good. Uh, Councilor Wright, Councilor Knack. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I believe we need to select item 9.1. Yes. And uh, I also have a quick question on 7.1. 7.1, okay. Okay, Councillor Rice. I would like to select 8.5. 8.5, okay. Oh. Uh, 8.5, 8.2 already selected, right? Yeah, 8.2 is already selected. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
So 7.1 is selected, 7.3 is selected, 8.2 is selected, 8.5 is selected, and 9.1 is selected. All right, can someone move the balance, please? Can someone move the balance of the reports? Or uh, so moved, Mr. Yeah, Mayor. Thank you. Second. Counselor Tang, Counselor Wright seconded. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Uh, I'll ask the city clerk to read back to us what has been already approved. Thank you, Mayor. The January 31st City Council has approved the following 7.2 Heritage Community Investment Program Grants. That was a Community and Public Services Committee report. 7.4 Non-Competitive Single Source Agreement. That was an Executive Committee report. Okay. Thank you. Request to speak. We have none. A request for specific time on the agenda. Councillor Hamilton? Or that, yeah. We need yeah, to the, right we have a there. request yeah. uh, that the following item be dealt with at a specific time on the agenda. And item 9.1, labor relations update. Uh, first item of business, Wednesday, February 1. That'll okay. be tomorrow morning. Yep. Need a seconder? Second. Second by Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Votes on bylaws not selected for debate. Councillor Cartmel. Thank you, Mayor Soki. I will move first reading of item 8.1, 8.3, and 8.4. Second. Second by Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohia, I'll move second reading of item 8.1 and 8.4. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Rice, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move consideration of third reading of item 8.1 and 8.4. Second. Second by Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Mayor Sohi, I'll move third and final reading of bylaw 20347 and bylaw 20386. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Rice. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that deals with bylaws. Any consular inquiries? None. Report to be dealt with at a different meeting? None. Request to reschedule reports? None. Unfinished business? None. Now we are going into our public reports. First item on the agenda is 7.1 2023 Council and Committee Calendar Change. Exempted by Councillor Knack. Councillor Knack, you need a presentation or you want to go No, Mayor, so you write the questions, please. Right, two questions. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Oh. Okay, good. Uh, sorry, and uh, I'm. it's possible my calendar isn't isn't uh, accurate right now, but, but I believe the request for the audit committee to have that special meeting 
uh, from 9 to noon on the 21st of April. That conflicts with uh, three other items, all of which which could impact members of the committee. And so I'm not sure if we've done a, a poll a, a, of that one because there's a home at AGM, according to my calendar, that runs till uh, 10 o'clock that morning. There's an EMRB special board meeting, I believe, that runs from nine to noon. And there's also, uh, well, I mean, I can make arrangements, uh, a municipal governance committee meeting of Alberta municipalities. And so I'm just wondering, I, I don't think I recall getting surveyed about that. And I'm wondering if maybe we can hold off on that change to survey audit committee members um, to find a date that doesn't conflict with, uh, for sure, the whole Met and the, and the EMRB. I, I recognize the other one is important, but I can try something different. Thank you, Councillor Knack, and we can certainly hold off to find a date that works better for the committee members. We didn't have all of the information on the specifics of EMRB, so we can also maybe get that and uh, find uh, some alternatives. I will just highlight that we do need to have uh, one of those meetings in, in April, so for sure that would need to come back, but we can certainly do some more work. Okay, in, in that case, yeah, Mayor Sohi, I, I'm happy to move the recommendation, but maybe without that particular change, just so we can um, do a quick circulation around audit committee members um, to see if there's a date that would work for uh, potentially more people and, and for sure not conflict with the home ed piece, which, which would impact all of us. Yeah, okay, I think that's a good idea. So uh, we will uh, take out the bullet one, the special audit committee meeting be scheduled for April 21st, 2020 for 9 a.m. to noon. Okay. And that's it for me. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. All right. Any other questions, colleagues? Seeing none, Councillor Neck, you want to move the recommendation, please? Yes, happy to move uh, the, the new recommendation that the following changes to the 2023 Council and Committee calendar be approved. Uh, in addition, that uh, agenda review committee be scheduled on June 27th, 2023 from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m., uh, cancellation that the July 25th, 2023 Agenda Review Committee meeting from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. be cancelled. Uh, adjustments that the orders of the day for the March 7th, 2023 Agenda Review Committee be uh, meeting from 8.30 to 9 a.m. be changed from 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. That the orders of the day for the April 18th, 2023 Agenda Review Committee meeting from 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. be changed to 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m that the orders of the day for the June 6, 2023 Agenda Review Committee meeting from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. be changed to 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m., that the orders of the day for the August 1, 2023 Agenda Review Committee meeting from 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. be changed to 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m., and the that the orders of the day for the September 5, 2023 Agenda Review Committee meeting from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. be changed to 8.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Need a seconder? Councillor Second. Councillor Tank, second that. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And uh, our next item is 7.3 Maple Ridge Industrial Stage 6 Revolving Industrial Service Servicing Fund Extension. And this was a recommendation from uh, Executive Committee. Uh, who is the Councilor Jans? Can you take the chair? Uh, it's Councilor Cartmel. Can you take the chair, please? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. And I will uh, just give a brief introduction. We had a lengthy conversation on this item at the executive committee. And we heard from uh, the representatives of the businesses in that area about the need for extension of this uh, servicing agreement uh, in order to uh, uh, build some of the uh, industrial complexes that are required uh, for that area for the uptake of industrial industrial growth and uh, this does not have any i mean uh, it's 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 the existing agreement that needs to be extended uh, to uh, to give that timeline extend the timeline to october 31st 2020 2026 and uh, and committee recommended this to council 
and you keep on. So I'll, I'll move the recommendation uh, in the, uh, uh, I'll move the committee's recommendation that administration recommend that the exemption to city policy C533A revolving industrial servicing fund to allow the Maple Ridge owners group to complete and end user development of Maple Ridge industrial stage six by October 31st, 2026, and they remain eligible for the revolving industrial services uh, servicing fund to be approved. Okay. That's it on my end. Second. Do you need a seconder? Councilor Cartmel, you'll be chairing this now because I'll move the recommendation. I'm sorry, I was on mute. My apologies. First time that's happened to me. Uh, so we have motion on the floor, and I believe Councilor Principe has seconded the motion. Uh, so we'll move to uh, questions of the motion then. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, Councillor Cartmel. Um, I do just have, I, I still have concerns about um, extending this, I, I think it's a third time. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering I, when, um, uh, when the investors are, are going to actually take action. Um, it seems to be the excuse of, of uh, economic conditions. But I, I do have some questions to, as a follow-up to Ms. Petron's memo to councillors. And I see that she's gone now. She was. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm there you are. Right. Okay. <laughs> you moved. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, um, in the memo that you sent, um, you indicated that there was, um, so we've already done a, they've already received a rebate of $4 million in 2019. And then in the, the memo that you provided us, there was another $4 million that's supposed to be, um, provided in 2025 and another 4 million in 2026. So to me, that's 12 million. And I thought it was for eight. Councillor Wright, the total rebate for the Maple Ridge Industrial Stage 6 is a total of 8 million. Um, so the second in the table that was in the memo to council, it was around what was projected. Um, so it was just the columns of what was projected. They're not intended to be added up in terms of what was shared. Um, so it's eight million is the total rebate for this project, not twelve. Okay, so why if four million was already paid out though, why is it projected to be two more? No, so uh, hi, Mark Pivar here. Just mm -hmm. to be clarify, uh, that first column was sort of the council, um, I guess, approved budget that they utilized for 2023 to 2026 budget because it was the best information they had at the time. And the second column is the projected based on the new data we have based on you know today's decision of 2026 being that payout. So we projected it to be, we originally thought it was gonna be 2025 and that's what the budget sort of allotted. But now that we have some updated information from the owners group, we're projecting 2026. So there'll be no 4 million payment in 2025. It will be moved to 2026 based on today's decision. So what's that updated information from the owners group? So that we can be assured that this will be completed in 2026. That's right. It was the request to move it to 2026. So therefore, we updated our projected. I mean, they still have up till 2024 to get this done. I, I can ensure that the developers are, if they're willing to make the 2024, that's really beneficial for them. They would like to make that date, but they just want to have that secured to have up till 2026. So they still have till 2024 under the current agreement. Um, this is just an extension to 2026, just for some security purposes. So, okay. Councillor Wright, this is an extension request for an additional two years to complete the re rest of the servicing and the end development. Um, they are actively working with the City of Edmonton through their servicing agreement and have commitments to make. Um, so there is a potential they could be finished earlier, but with this uh, decision before Council is to extend the time that they have to 2026. Okay, so that updated information, is that an actual plan that they have in place? I just... They have yes, that's based, they, that's based around when they're projecting to finish 17th Street and then obviously some on-site on um, private development uh, perspectives of when they're going to have that vertical construction and building construction on board. That's kind of their plan as of now. And again, their plan will always try to move forward if they can, if they can get in the ground faster and have better um, turnaround in economic conditions for them to be able to work that faster, they are willing to move that data ahead too. Okay, and does any of this work hinge on work that's being done in the, the, the Fulton Creek industrial area? I know they were talking about extending part of, I think it's 56th Avenue out 
east towards 17th Street. Right, yeah, so it's the same area, it's a different basin, so that's going to have its own sort of, you know, um, system to collect money kind of thing. It's a different basin versus Maple versus Southeast Industrial. But yeah, they, they are tied together. There's some work happening on 51 Avenue that will kind of come out um, to 17th Street, but the work being done by Fulton Creek Business Park at 34th Street isn't necessarily tied to this point. It is one piece to build Roper Road to eventually get to 17th Street, but that's a future future development for sure. But they are not necessarily tied financially. So Councillor Wright, the projects are not dependent on each other. Okay, so um, Maple, the Maple Ridge Industrial can go ahead if if they don't get that, the, the road, either 51st or 56th or Roper Road, I'm not sure exactly which one it is. Correct. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I think that's, all the questions I have, I, I is there any way to, to have like report back in 2024 as to how they are proceeding? Councillor Wright, um, happy to connect with your office to share some updates as they progress um, with development around uh, in the next over over 2023. Okay, okay, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Any further questions on the motion or to administration? Seeing none, we have a motion on the floor. Then anyone that cares to speak to the motion. Please click on. Seeing none, uh, Mayor Sophie to close. No, nothing to add. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. Uh, and that is carried, and I return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Okay, so that item is dealt with. Seven four dealt with. Eight point one passed. Eight point two, bylaw two zero three five six, a bylaw to authorize the City of Edmonton to undertake construct and finance integrated infrastructure services project, William Horlick Park rehabilitation, exempted by Councillor Rutherford, ready for first reading. Uh, do, does, does council need a presentation on this? Council Rutherford, you need a presentation. No, two questions, all right. I uh, don't have questions on the Oh, you, have, you don't have questions on the bylaw, but you have a subsequent, right? That's correct. Okay, colleagues, questions on the by, borrowing bylaw. I see no questions, and councillor, just to, am I? No, just hold on, hold on. I am waiting for people to sign up. Yeah, it's 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 not showing on the screen. Jennifer's on. Can Jennifer's you on. please? It's what what's the reason? Just give us a moment. We're just okay. refreshing. There we go. No worries. Here we are. Here we go. Now we have colleagues signed up. Councillor Rice, and I will. Uh, Encourage council members to focus our questions on the borrowing bylaw and uh, any information germane to that aspect. Uh, please go ahead, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. So, in terms of the uh, borrowing uh, amount, uh, can you please clarify if the tree cutting or removing costs are part of? those borings. Yeah, it's the total cost of the project, which includes that. So do you have a breakdown how much cost for the 220 trees and cut and We don't it? have a cost for that. That's a granular level of detail that isn't related to the borrowing by law. And is, so if public requests information, then how do we respond to that? And because right now, the there's public or right respondents request this information. Yeah, there's standard inquiry processes that when those come in, you can work with our department to provide that information. And if it becomes something that council is interested in receiving in terms of costs associated with a specific breakdown on a capital project, we can provide that as well. So is there any uh, project and for project breakdown is not included in this $133 million? Again, this is a borrowing bylaw yeah. to undertake the work that council approved as part of the 23 yeah. to 26 capital So the, spe budget. the specific components of the project 
uh, were approved as part of the budget process. This is a global amount that is required to proceed ahead with this work. So borrowing law does not specify or itemize uh, the specific cost within the uh, within the projects. Those are more broken down in the in the uh, in the project profile, which we approved during the budget. Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, clarification. Uh, the next question about influence. Uh, we are going to replant those trees. Um, does replanting expenditure a part of this borrows? It is. So, based on my first question, my understanding is this is not uh, provided the detail for how much cost for that piece as well, right? No, uh, those would have been uh, details that we, you know, if, if council needed that level of granular detail, it would have been something that could have been asked during the capital budget. Again, uh, as the mayor said, council approved the capital project. This is the borrowing bylaw to allocate the funding to undertake the capital project. Uh, so if this borrows <clears throat> cover replanting expenditure, uh, is that safe to say the replanting trees will not be uh, the cost and from different <clears throat> program and approved in the 2023-26 budget? The scope that has been identified for the Horlack um, Rehabilitation Project covers all, um, sorry, the budget that's been approved for the Horlack Park Rehabilitation Project includes the scope of re um, renewing the park and the associated tree removal and replanting uh, for the project. Um, thank you. And then, so my next question still regarding the, um, this bylaw. Uh, yes, I, I understand this operational project decision, not the council's decision, and for the tree cutting and the removing decision. But what's the response to address the concerns from public regarding the perceived the major trees and I the transparency. That, that would be something that if you need an, an additional information, council members, about the tree removal and all that, I think that's uh, information that you can request through administra to administration through, through an inquiry or, uh, or in other ways, but that is not germane to okay. the bylaw. Okay, so if, not this, if this by now was not passed, uh, what's the possible impact could be. I can answer that from law, if you would like. Okay. Sure. It's Ingrid Johnson from law. If we do not have this borrowing bylaw passed, construction cannot begin. Uh, so the construction begin and as scheduled mm -hmm. already, and when is March of this year or? We, we've been taking preparations on the basis of council approving the capital project as part of the 23 to 26 to assemble the resources to undertake construction. Um, it, it would be quite um, troubling if council approved something as part of a capital budget then chose not to approve the uh, corresponding funding sources to allocate, the pro to allocate to the project to undertake the work. Uh, thank you. That's all my question. Appreciate your answers. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Hamilton, you want to move this or you have questions? Uh, no, just to move. Go ahead, please. Reading. Yep. Uh, I'll move first reading of item 8.2. Second. Second by Councillor. Uh, moved by Councillor Hamilton, second by Councillor Rutherford. We have a first reading on the floor. Uh, anyone to speak? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll go to Councillor Rutherford for her subsequent motion. No, just only one reading. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'm just pulling it up. 
and I'll use the wording that I, that I have, that administration provide a report to committee with lessons learned on changes in the scope of the environmental impact on mature trees and share the plan for tree management for the William Horlack Park Rehabilitation Project. Councilor Jans, you want to second that? Second. Okay, all right. Uh, subsequent, we'll just see it on the screen here. All right, any questions on the subsequent? Sorry, so, oh yeah, Councillor uh, Rutherford, can you make the brief introduction, please? Yes, thank you. So, you know, I was, I was a member of executive committee when this environmental impact report came and it, it mentioned in their minor tree impact. And I feel like the scope really um, changed and I feel like if we had known that scope when it would bid at committee, we maybe would have had a different uh, turnout, a different conversation with community. And, and it, it's concerning for me. And so I just feel like it's, an, it's a great opportunity to just pause and reflect, not stop the project, but to pause and reflect on if there's lessons learned on how we can strengthen our environmental impact assessments and look for you know, foreseeable impacts or be uh, really uh, almost, I would say, rather than being conservative in our estimate of environmental impacts, maybe we need to be more, um, take a side of there will be higher impact in our environmental impact assessment report. So I just wanna have that conversation at committee. And I think that, uh, you know, the public has, this has uh, brought up many concerns from the public once the numbers of mature trees impacted are are known, and so I think we, we owe it to the public to also be able to share the plan for our um, tree management, and and I think that that helps also to have members of the public learn our processes as well. So I think all in all, it's a good, a good conversation to have, and so that's why I wanted to bring this yeah, forward. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. So this report will generate all those questions, and we can debate at that time. We just want to know the the timelines for this report to come back because recognizing Just many, many other... the regular time frame is fine. I'm sorry? Consider... The regular time frame is fine, whatever is it the okay? standard time frame is. Okay, that's fine then. Okay. All right, good. All right. Uh, can you please identify that in the, in the, uh, uh, in the motion? Sorry, subsequent. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. I appreciate this uh, motion. I actually addressed some questions I have and also address some questions I heard from the public. Uh, I do have the follow-up uh, questions. The first one about, uh, do we have any plan and a specific perceive uh, to protect our mature trees when we do this uh, cutting and removing? And specifically, and for 220 trees, we only have 17 trees a day. And for other trees, uh, if we are going to cutting and moving, do we have a specific uh, plan how we ensure the mature trees be protected? And because that takes time and to grow and for the trees and from the little to mature, that takes years and years. Well, certainly something that we can include in the report, uh, but council has approved a public tree bylaw, which is essentially methods to protect mature trees during construction, not only uh, city construction, but also uh, third party construction or, or uh, private sector construction. And then as part of any capital project, we have a corporate tree management policy, which essentially is to ensure that we're um, uh, uh, making the inventory whole from, a, from an impact perspective, because uh, construction does result in some reduction in terms of tree. Um, so those are the two mechanisms. Then, uh, of course, we do uh, environmental impact assessment for projects that are within the River Valley bylaw boundary. Okay, uh, thank you so much for mentioning that public trees bylaw, and actually that gives us a clear understanding, and even though uh, we have the, some concern and for the public. Uh, thanks for that piece. And another piece uh, is transparency of the project. I would like to ask the question, and then, when we public engagement happened for the project, and then, so what did uh, city actually uh, implement some public engagement to improve that public transparency and for our Edmontonians, for our Edmontonians to understand the scope 
of this project. So can you、uh, describe a little bit the activities we already took and in the past? So there was uh, numerous uh, public engagement touch points on the development of the Horlack Park project.、Uh, what we heard document is on the website for the project specific. In terms of the type of public engagement activities that were undertaken, it would have been articulating the planned designs, the planned improvements, identifying the impacts. But of course, as designs evolve,、um, there are there are items that change, which.、Uh, What I believe this report is trying to get a sense of: of、uh, um, are there any different approaches we should be taking with respect to environmental impact assessments?、Um, so that's that's sort of the standard、uh, approach that we take for our capital projects.、Uh, so it's fair to say public engagement activities、uh, did happen, and then in the way our as our city normally. To engage the public for this project scope. Yes, there's a public engagement policy that we follow, and this project followed that.、Uh, okay, so、uh, just to response the comments from public. It's the first time to hurt certain things. For example, the how many trees be or be cutting, and how many trees will be removed.、Uh, is that license nor? I, I know this will be reflect that, and then. To provide that information at the beginning, and for public to understand what the tree is specific for this park, and many people are at Montonis love it. I'm not sure what the question yeah, is. Yeah. So.、Uh, yeah, I I know, and then a little bit frustrating, and from public to see so many trees will be removed and cutting. I think and that information think, will be provided、yeah. as part of this report, Councillor.、Uh, uh, Uh, right, so I'm being、yeah. very lenient in the form of questions being asked. Right, but I think we need to be very careful. Yeah, I just want to confirm, and from the public engagement perspective, you can ask you ask、yeah. questions on the public engagement. They answer that, but on the trees, how many, and how I think that this report will generate that information. Okay. Yeah, please. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, Councilor Reyes, that concludes the questions. Anyone else have any questions? All right. We have a subsequent.、Uh, no more questions. Anyone to speak? To speak, Councillor Jans. Thank you. I want to、uh, just express my support for this. I think it's.、Um, um, I've been in, just in the last year. There's been a couple occasions where. Uh, trees have been cut, and I know it's been very, very controversial in the community, which is a good thing. I, I, I love how much our city loves trees. I mean, I, I wish、um, some folks apply, applied that same scrutiny to all aspects of our climate emergency as they do trees. So I'm, I'm very thankful that we have such a due diligence on the part of the community around,、um, uh, around our trees. And、uh, I realize that we can't, as frustrating as it may seem, we can't relitigate. Decisions made at budget or at previous meetings, but I think Councillor Rutherford、um, has a, a a very sensible subsequent motion here that will provide us more information on how to、uh, navigate these kinds of conversations in future. I know it's something、um, administration is is looking at. I think it's something for us as councillors that can equip us to ask.、Uh, More and and uh, uh, more pointed questions on on future projects as well too. We know that as we proceed in city plan, that we're going to be, you know, planting millions of more trees, but also taking care of the ones we have, be it through minor park projects or or major retrofits, is is something to consider. So,、um, I think this、uh, isn't getting into the、uh, what would we say, getting into the roots too much, getting into the weeds too much. I don't think this is getting into the roots too much. I think this is.、Uh, Uh, the saplings. There we go. The saplings. I think this is uh, uh, quite sensible and will help us. So, again, appreciate everybody、uh, working on this and voicing their concern, and、uh, certainly heard loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yeah, just you know,、uh, encourage my colleagues to support this. As mentioned by Councillor Jans, I in no way wanted to re-debate the budget decision. However, I do think you know, with the concern that we have heard from the public,、uh, having this conversation、uh, is is always a good thing. And there's things I think, as Councillor Jans mentioned, that we can learn, administration can learn, and the public can learn about our tree processes. So, 
um, I would uh, just encourage you to support the subsequent. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that dealt with the 7.2. Uh, 7.3 was approved, 7.4 was approved. Now we are going to uh, 8.5, bylaw 20304, City of Edmonton Ward Boundaries and Council Composition Bylaw Amendment number four. This was exempted by Councillor Rice and the bylaw is ready for first reading. Councillor Rice, you have, a, you need a, a, a presentation? Uh, yes, please. Okay. We'll go to administration for a presentation. Good morning, Council. Um, so as you're aware, new ward boundaries were recommended by the Ward Boundary Commission in 2020. These boundaries were approved um, by the City Council through bylaw 19366 and came into effect on election day, October 18th, 2021. In the year following a general election, the city's uh, uh, war boundary design policy requires the returning officer to send a summary to council through executive committee, identifying the current population and number of electors for each ward, the variance from the optimal size of each ward, and any recommendations for boundary adjustments before the next election. Next slide, thank you. Um, the criteria that was used for the post-2021 Edmonton election ward boundary review um, was really focused on population versus number of electors to ensure that um, the optimum uh, equality across wards is that there's no variance more than 25% plus or minus and also to evaluate future growth in the wards. And when we did that analysis, um, no wards appeared to at this time um, to grow more than, uh, have a variance more than 10% over the next three municipal elections. We also took the time to review our lessons learned from the 2021 Edmonton election and sought out opportunities to address some of those, those issues, particularly focusing on the improvement of voting processes by reducing the number of ballot styles. Next slide. Um, and we brought two proposals to executive committee and uh, executive committee approved one of those proposals to move forward. Um, and that's the, the amendment that's before council today. Um, and that proposal would move the Calgary Trail South neighborhood from Ward Carjillo into Ward Papasteo. Um, it's a relatively minor adjustment. Uh, it would not impact any eligible electors. In the 2019 municipal census, it did appear that there were 11 residents in that neighborhood are most likely living in, in hotels, and it's a relatively small parcel of land impacting about um, 0.65 square kilometers. But what it would do um, and what it would support would be reducing the number of ballot styles, uh, particularly in Ward Carjillo for advance voting and on election day. And so that would reduce two ballot styles, um, one uh, public school uh, ballot style and one Catholic school ballot style. Next slide. Um, so the next steps would be first reading of bylaw 20304, um, followed by a two week advertising period, followed by a 90 or a 60 day petition window. And then uh, we would bring back the bylaw for second and third reading. Um, and then any amended ward boundaries would come into effect on election day of 2025, which is October 20th, 2025. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. We'll go to questions now. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. So thank you for the presentation. And then that's, that's very clear. Um, uh, just a few questions. And then as I heard um, this change in, and it isn't really, really minor change. What's the specific why this change needs to be done? 
Thank you, Councillor Rice. So the, the proposed change would be to reduce those ballot styles. Um, so that was a lessons learned from the 2021 Edmonton election. Because of misalignment between the, the school uh, division boundaries and uh, the city of Edmonton boundaries, we have about, is it over 50 ballot styles on election day? We have over 50 ballot styles on, uh, on election day. Um, and that can be up to seven at uh, individual voting stations during advance vote, which can lead to confusion for both voters and uh, election workers. So we reviewed all of the word boundaries with that in mind and we did propose two, two amendments that would reduce the number of ballot styles. Um, and this one would move that Calgary South Trail neighborhood, which is a whole neighborhood from one ward to another. Um, and we were trying to find the fewest changes as possible because it's a minor review. Um, but the real goal would be to reduce those ballot styles. Uh, so 34 Ave, 34 Ave is a, is a boundary and between the two words. So with the proposed change, even the slight change, that impact to another word. And then, so that means right now with this change, uh, the past words and work it into uh, Cross 34 Ave. Is that possible? Is to keep 34 Avenue as a boundary and between these two words, and then also and meet the needs and the no impact for other things. So uh, it wouldn't impact um, the number of ballot styles we'd be reducing if we made that, that amendment, uh, Councillor Rice. We would still reduce the two ballot styles if we made that change. We don't know exactly where those 11 residents from 2019 live, so we don't know if that would impact where they are, but there's no estimated eligible voters, so it wouldn't impact so, that. so it's just, it would separate the neighborhood and that's my only flag is that, that uh, in terms of how we've, um, the ward boundary design policy speaks about um, criteria, one of the criteria is to aim to keep neighborhoods out in entire ward, so not to divide them. So that would be the only issue and that's why we would have proposed that change the way it is, even though I know it's kind of creates a unique shape. Yeah, because it's cross the 34F boundary and get into another world. And then, so if you keep the 34F new and still uh, still meet the purpose and for the change, and it will not impact and that benefits. And then, because it's so little and only 11 residents. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, uh, may I just uh, refer and put the amendment, refer this back to make that slight, slight adjustment and still meet the original benefits for this proposal change. From our current analysis, it wouldn't impact the number of ballots okay. we would be reducing. We'd still be able to do that. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so then I, I rely on the advice and from City Kirk and what process for to do that minor adjustment. Sorry, Councillor, I missed part of that question, but I, I believe you're asking in terms of process for Move right forward. now. Yeah. So the bylaw itself, I believe, is ready for first reading. And so it could be um, done similarly to the previous bylaw that was on the agenda, uh, where count, Council considers the first reading. And then if you, oh, sorry, rather, that just one moment. Apologies, uh, my mistake, I, I wasn't fully thinking through. So because it changes what needs to be in the bylaw itself, which is changing what would need to be advertised, um, it, the report itself would need to be referred back uh, to administration to bring forward the bylaw again. Uh, so for two weeks or how long? Uh, in terms of, of completing that work, we could either work to council's uh, normal timeline. Um, it's a relatively small adjustment, so we could turn that around in, in pretty quick time. Okay. Okay, maybe like uh, the next time. Okay. okay, so is there any wording I can use? Okay. All right, we can work with clerk yeah. in, in the meantime. Councillor Rice, Councillor Tang, questions? Yeah, thank you very much for bringing this back. Um, you started this work when? Um, we began the review uh, spring of 2022, so like April, March. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, because I remember having this conversation last summer and uh, you were gonna bring back the presentation uh, and that was one. Um, so we brought this to executive committee in October of 2022. Okay. Yeah. So we've had like three months or so of time to review and also it was referred back. So we had lots of opportunities to provide input and for adjustment to get to this point, right? Uh, we followed council's timelines, yeah. yes. Yeah, and so to refer this back would mean further advertising, further staff time to do the analysis and all of that. It would require a bit more staff time, but to be clear, we haven't advertised this yet. We brought this to council to ensure general interest in, in the changes before we advertise the bylaw publicly. But you have put in a significant amount of time in the research and the analysis to get to this recommendation, and you've considered all kinds of options. That's correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cartmel, can you take the chair? I just have a couple of questions. I have the chair. Thank you. Can you... Um, I, I'm familiar with the area, right? So, which... You're trying to bring that those residents into into the community, right? As part of one community. So, it, actually, could we have the the presentation up again? Um, and it's, I believe, it's the third or fourth slide, and we can. There we go. Um, and so, the current boundary is the 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 dark line, the black line around, and yeah. the change we're trying to make is to move it to on the other side of the green line. Yeah. Um, and so that is the Calgary South, uh, uh, um, sorry, Calgary Trail South neighborhood. Yeah. It is a more, mostly industrial neighborhood, but it's a, a whole neighborhood in yeah. that line. Mm -hmm. And then they become part of Gary O neighborhood, right? One of the Gary O neighborhoods. And so it's currently part of uh, Cadillo, yeah. um, but okay. it would move it into Papasteo. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. okay, I see. Okay, got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right, so and that's one of the principles we follow as part of the review, keeping people attached to a community. Yeah, it's one of the criteria as a community of interest to try and keep neighborhoods whole. Okay, got it, okay, that's what I did. Thank you so much. And I'll take the chair back. Sorry, I returned the chair. Thank you. So you have wording for Councillor Rice's. Yes, Councillor Rice, I've I've given that to you, you have it, okay. Councillor Rice, I'll come to you to uh, please move that, here we go. Can you read that into the record, Councillor Rice? Uh, yes, um, I move that to January 31st, 2023, Office of the 30 Kirk Report, OCC 01350, be referred back to administration to re revise bylaw 203 for City of Edmonton Ward Boundaries and Council Compensation Bylaw Attachment Number 4 to move Calgary Trail South Neighborhood between 23rd Avenue and 34th Avenue and from Cahiro and to EP County PLC to align better with 34th Avenue as boundary between Ward uh, Papstill and Epicoca and EPLC and return to City Council due date February 24 and 24th, 2023 City Council. Second. Second by Councillor Rice. Just quickly, if we could change the word from Council. Uh, so no, just told them, Council. Yeah. I think it says com Council Compensation, just is com Council Composition. So if you could change. Oh, Composition. That. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rice, can you make the introduction, please? Oh, uh, sure. So, because it's my first time to saw this change, and then uh, when I look at this change, and also look at the um, the the reason why the change uh, needs made, and then what impact could be for the world. Um, so, I ask. It, I ask the city clerk office if it's possible to consider as a, as a consistent 34 avenue and between the word past 
and EPCOG and EPLC. And even with this minor adjustment, and there is no impact for the bio, uh, bullet styles and no impact for the original, the purpose of the change and the plus, the advertising and then is not started yet. And then this change will not take uh, the city clerk office of a month, a huge amount of time, and then to do any further work because he's already there. And so I encourage uh, my colleagues to consider this. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Jan's questions? No, debate. To debate, that's to speak, right? Councillor Rutherford? To speak. To speak. Any questions? Any more questions on this? If not, we'll go to speak. Councillor Jans to speak. So I think this is, I'm, I'm opposed to this uh, amendment. I think this is way too into the weeds. If you look at the map of Ward Papasteo, it's not even consistent with 34th Avenue. Like on the on the west portion, it dips down around Westbrook and Aspen Gardens and, and um, touches much further south. On the other side, um, it, uh, you know, for it, it kind of follows the, the alignment with the trail. So I am in support of what administration has drafted, and um, I'm not supportive of uh, an amendment to, to change this. It to, isn't uh, it isn't necessary. So um, board boundaries are always tricky. There's um, you know people have uh, attachments to certain places or or thoughts and and or or uh, um, uh, communities, so that's that's why it's a, it's always a very tricky process to be involved in. But um, this is such a minor adjustment on the part of uh, administration, and and uh, I support their thinking and the recommendation here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jens. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, well, I appreciate the intent of the mover. I also cannot support this refer back motion. Uh, I'm a part of executive committee, as is Councillor Rice, and we thoroughly debated this in October. And in fact, at that point, referred this bylaw back for amendments because there was also a proposed amendment bylaw boundary change between Ward and Olnick and O'Damon. And so I, I really question why this wouldn't have been brought up at that point. Um, from a process perspective, it, I, I think we, we, we undermine our own processes by continually doing these kind of things. We have committee for a reason and we have counsel for a reason. Um, so for, for that reason, I, I cannot support this at this time. I would have entertained it at committee, but I think we're too far gone now. And I think that the, the change is, is minor. And I, I think that the sound rationale of administration for the proposed change as is in the bylaw is prudent and I will support the original bylaw. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Tang. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just to support my colleagues' uh, comments, I will also add that we not only do we undermine our own processes, we also undermine the amount of time and effort that city administration has put into this. I appreciated the thorough process that they have done to engage council members on this, um, as well as accommodate some of the referral back already happened. We've had multiple debates about this already, and I do not think this is a good use of resource. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will be supporting this. Um, I do realize that there was debate, and I recall it. I remember that we discussed it, but sometimes we don't notice things, or we forget, or we have ideas that come along after, and I believe that's why uh, the clerk's office is here now, that before they make the changes, they were just going through it again with us. So I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Cartmel, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. I, I will not support this. Uh, one is that we have gone through the process. Uh, I think we need to respect that process. But also, there's a principle that one of the criteria that administration follows is uh, kind of keeping communities together, right? And, uh, uh, in, in as part of this wall, I, you know, I think I th also third reason is this is too much into the weeds. This is too much kind of going into uh, micromanaging the ward boundaries, right? So I think that we need to be very careful because we can always identify certain areas that we want to have in our, like I don't know how you represent the city, but in, I remember conversations earlier on when. Uh, 
uh, wards, boundaries were reviewed, we need to be very careful. We need to respect that process. So can't support it, sorry. Uh, I'll take the chair back. Return the chair. Thank you, and uh, I'll go to Councillor Rice to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Solhi, and thank you and for, uh, for my uh, colleagues' comments, but I do want to clarify the first lesson. This proposed change today was not discussed back to the executive committee. And then because back to the executive committee, that time we discussed the change with a different word. <clears throat> and then this, this specific change, I, I didn't recall and in the, um, in the proposed change and at the executive committee. So that's just something I want to confirm. And then the second, and then I do appreciate, and Mayor Sohi, you talk about uh, let's get out of the weeds. Uh, but the reason and for me to get into this, and then is not about we want to get into the weeds, and is the equal opportunity for everybody, for every councillor to provide feedback, and for any reporting come in front of the council. Uh, specific. This is a very, very minor change. If it's minor, I know why it's happening at the beginning. And uh, why this proposal change even needed for the 11 residents. If this work is already done, <clears throat> and why we can down the way and really refract uh, the equity and the equality value this council always and implemented. And then for 30, 34F, and that's his boundary, very clear. If you look at this proposed change, and the between, I'm not move the entire change, I'm just move the between 34F and 23rd Avenue. And that portion is actually is under the word EPLT. So uh, I encourage my uh, colleagues to consider this, and then if not, and I still think and then different perspective, different points is equally important to be heard in the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Please vote. Mayor, could we check? We thought we saw Councillor Paquette on the board, but perhaps he did oh. not join. All right, Councillor Paquette, are you back uh, in the meeting? We, we will mark him as absent. That's, okay. that's our right. apologies. We okay. have all the votes. Please display the votes. That is defeated. Okay, that's 8.3. Sorry, 8.5. Mr. Mayor, um, I can... Just hold on. Uh, move the first reading. Uh, yes, please move the first reading. Councillor uh, Councilor Tang, please, go ahead. Uh, I would like to move the first reading of bylaw 20304. Okay. Second. Second by Councillor Rutherford. We have a first reading on the floor, please. Oh, anyone to speak? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we have a 9.1, that's for later. Motions pending. And uh, uh, why don't we First of all, I'll ask council members if there are motions that they're motions pending if they're withdrawing, and maybe we can deal with that first. Uh, then we will follow follow the order. Uh, and uh, I'm going to withdraw. I'll start with me. I'll, I'm going to withdraw 10.16 because that is not required anymore. Uh, this issue will be dealt with at the Explore Edmonton AGM. That's uh, Explore Edmonton Annual Net Operating Requirement. 
uh, uh, are there any other uh, withdrawals? Uh, if you do have withdrawals, can you please sign up? So we'll just follow, or maybe raise your hand. Then, Councillor Councilor uh, Tang, you have any? You want to withdraw anything? Uh, yes, I did sign up. I think we just need to refresh. Uh, I would like to withdraw 10.13, Explore Edmonton Tourism Master Plan. I understand work is already underway, yeah. uh, and therefore this is no longer necessary. Thank you. Okay. Any other motions to be withdrawn? Councillor uh, Salvador? Yeah, uh, so I can withdraw 10.22, service commencement for the Metro to Blatchford extension, as that work is already underway. 10.22. Okay. Okay. Um, Councillor Rutherford? Uh, I, I could remove, um, sorry, 10.2 as long as I can get just confirmation from uh, Commissioner Corbel that that work is also underway. Sorry, 10 point? 10.20? Yes, 10.20, oh, I apologize. Okay. 10.20. I, I believe it is, yeah. Okay, then I can withdraw that one okay. as well. All right. Any other withdrawals? Uh, I'll look to council colleagues not attending in person. Okay. I've, I've requested, but I'm not showing on the board. Oh, sorry, Councillor Wright, go ahead. Just raise your hand. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I was going to look at removing 10.2 um, um, just because of conversations with Mr. Jevney, but I'm just wondering, I was going to change it to a memo, and I'm just wondering if I can just get confirmation I can get that information otherwise. Okay. Yes, we certainly could do that. Yes, okay, thank okay. you, then I'll remove. So that's 10.2. Uh, Two, Two? Okay. okay, got it. Any other? Okay, seeing none, then we will uh, proceed as listed. I know Councillor Stevenson uh, probably be on her way, so we'll leave that when she comes back. And we'll go to 10.3, fine increase for bylaw 5590, traffic bylaw road right away. Councillor Wright, can you please move it? Move your okay, so motion. I move I move that uh, administration provide a report on increasing the fine for traffic bylaw 5590 related to offenses. This is weird reading. Um, related to obstructions along road right of way being increased to $2,500. Okay, we need a seconder. Second. Councillor Jen seconded that. Please make the introduction. Um, just during one of my ride-alongs with peace officers uh, this past year. Um, it was brought to my attention how um, how um, contractors or, or builders or whatever can be blocking um, roadways and um, mostly long service roads in that adjacent to the the properties that they're they're working on and there's a $25 um, a day permit that's required and currently Failing to have these permits is only a fine of $250. So builders can just avoid having to get the permits and um, only face a $250 fine. I, I feel that by increasing it to $2,500 is more of a deterrent and encourages them um, to not only get the permits but to also complete the work um, in a timely manner. Um, the one instance um, that I was that was brought to my attention, it was about a year since um, they had actually had a permit. Um, for, for blocking the roadway with equipment and construction materials. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Before I go to uh, Council members for questions, I just need some uh, somewhat consensus among Council members recognizing that we have quite a bit of work over the next number of months mm -hmm. undertaking OP12 and that we, any all of these pending motions that if if they do not relate to OP12, that we uh, change the due date to uh, the fourth quarter, if possible, because that gives us enough time to uh, undertake that, for that very important work. And this probably won't be related to uh, OP12, so it's constantly right, you'll be okay if the report comes back at fourth quarter? Sure, that's okay, fine. Okay, good, all right, thank you so much. Councillor Hamilton. 
Um, maybe to administration. Uh, the way I'm reading this, this looks like an increase to OSCAM permits. Is that accurate or is this different? This would be the associated fine that accompanies okay. the OSCAM permit. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe to the mover, um, how did you arrive at the number $2,500? Just thought it was a good deterrent. Okay. And, per and perhaps some um, recommendations could be made in the report as to what would be a, an appropriate amount. Yeah, that would be my friendly amendment that we don't um, uh, dictate or, or presume what the appropriate sort of amount might be. It might come in lower, it might come in way higher. So um, if, if you would be amenable to that, to striking um, everything after increased, which would be the word two and the number. Yeah, I right. consider that friendly, thank you. Thank you. So the sentence will end right away being increased, right? Yeah. Okay, got it. That's friendly? Yep. That is friendly? Got it. Uh, okay, Councillor Tang? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm good with the intent of this. I guess i just wondering if administration can just... Recently, that we had a report about OSCAM, or I can't remember if it was during the budget. Um, the current... And I remember OSCAM was falling short of its goal of fees. Do I have that right? So the uh, amount of revenue that we were recovering for OSCAM permits was lower than initially projected. At one time, there was no charge for an OSCAM permit, and the intent was to add a fee to uh, incentivize um, people using the roadway to uh, tighten up the time frames they were disrupting the traffic. We had a projection for revenue amount, and uh, what ended up happening was it was actually a shorter duration. We saw a decrease, so uh, the revenues were, sh were less than initially projected. And, and what did your um, research find to have caused that decrease? So a couple of things. We did see a decrease during the pandemic, but we also saw a shorter duration. So uh, what we saw was companies were uh, being more diligent, not only in the time that they were spending, but in a little bit more planning time in terms of when they could uh, get out and do the work, as opposed to taking, uh, say, a three-week permit and just getting out in that time frame. They would actually uh, be more diligent in the scheduling component. Um. And, and would you see something uh, like this uh, potentially, I guess, I guess encourage or, um, in, you know, in, in practice? I, I think we'd want to do that work because there may be, um, you know, uh, some other impacts. We would do some research in addition to the okay. other uh, research we've already done. And we would basically look at what would be an appropriate amount um, if it's different than what we're projecting or have in place now versus what uh, other jurisdictions are doing and what their uh, observations were in terms of results. Okay, well, no, that's fine. And I guess I, uh, yeah, again, I'm, I'm good with the intent. I think I was initially just a little bit apprehensive about if currently we're not necessarily reaching those targets, um, could we set this back further if, anyways, but if you will kind of explore all of that in the work itself, that will you know certainly alleviate some of my concerns. Yeah, the report will tell the whole story, not just the fine amount. It'll look yeah. at the impact on duration of disruption. Uh, and would you also, I guess, talk to industry too for this report? Yes, we would definitely, because they are, are part of um, the stakeholder group we would need to consult with. Okay, great, thank you very much, that's all. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Jans? Um, I guess my, my question would be to administration. I understand as part of OP12, we're going to be looking at a number of aspects, not that fines are revenues, but I just wanted to confirm, would this work be included or germane to OP12? Uh, <clears throat> I think it kind of depends on where we end up going with OP12, so it's kind of hard to answer. I, I don't have this particular one or the other one yeah. as a specific action item on OP12, but so I'm, I don't know. I'm yeah. certainly in supportive of the intent. I'm supportive of the friendly amendment. And there's a number of um, different bylaw issues that I think could probably be um, brought to 2023. Uh, but I'm wondering if instead of having an ad hoc number of, um, uh, like I'll, I'll support this today, but I'm just wondering maybe if we could come up with a better way to just sort of do a comprehensive review of all of the fines and uh, 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 penalties related to 
um, non-compliance. Yeah, we could take a, take a look at that, Councilor. We just haven't gotten that far yet in the mm -hmm. OP12 process. So we can maybe take a look at that and provide some commentary on that on our update in February. Yeah, and then, and, okay. Uh, so Because the, the other intersection, of course, we're doing some work as well on the public space bylaw mm -hmm. uh, work, and I want to make sure that that aligns well with everything we're doing as well. So, uh, Yep, duly noted. Uh, would, uh, Great. That's it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Jan. So that concludes the questions. Now we're ready to vote. Councillor Wright, you want to say some closing remarks, or are you ready to vote? I'm ready to vote. Okay, let's vote, please, then. Okay. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And I think Councillor Paquette is back in the meeting, right? Yeah. Uh, 10.4, fine increase for bylaw 13145, animal licensing and control, interfer uh, interference with peace officer. Councillor Wright. Um, thank you. I move that administration provide a report on increasing the fine for bylaw 13145, animal licensing and control, interference with peace officer, parkland to 250, um, and provide information on how that would increase revenue. Again, this was going through the different fees and fines um, and permits during uh, budget deliberations, and I noted that the, um, the, the fine for uh, interference with the peace officer in traffic was $250, and in parkland is only $100, so I just thought they should have the same weighting, and uh, suggesting uh, this increase then for the parkland officers to 250. Good. Thank you, Councillor Wright. And uh, to Andre, this could come back as fourth quarter per, as part of the other bylaw as well, right? Yes, that would be okay, so helpful. If you could make Thank it fourth quarter, please. Uh, and that's as long as you don't finish up going through reviews of all the bylaws anyhow, right? Yeah, correct, yeah. Councillor. I mean, we, we okay. you know, with through the course of OP12, we may if, look at them all. If we could bring it Earlier we would, but okay, got yeah, it. No, that gives us some flexibility. Appreciate it. Okay, yeah, we need I, it. I wouldn't want to duplicate the, the work. Yeah. Okay. Need a seconder, please. Seconder, Second. Councillor Tang. Okay. Uh, okay, we have a motion on the floor. Now, Councillor Rutherford. Questions? Yeah. Um, to Mr. Corbold. What, what work is, how does this intersect with some of that open space bylaw work that's happening? Like, is this overlap, is it duplication, or is it separate? Or OP12 for that matter? Um, with OP12, we just don't know yet, because I, you know, that, that'll probably be, we can, we can sort of clarify that, I think, yeah. in February. Uh, I think on the first question, I, I'd defer to um, uh, the city solicitor. So, Michelle, do you want to comment so, on that? So the, the main focus of the bylaw project on the public spaces is we've got three main bylaws, so parkland, yeah. uh, conduct of pa uh, transit, uh, and public spaces. So there are, though, other, other bylaws we're going to bring in if, mm -hmm. if, if they align with the project. You know, these, these don't currently align I'm with our project. Um, there are a number of bylaws that have fines uh, in them that aren't currently in scope for well for that's what that's we're kind of what I'm getting at is I've noticed now a pattern we've we've increased fines kind of on an ad hoc basis I'm starting to see with our bylaws that's true. and I'm concerned that it's actually the wrong motion and it should be a motion for a body of work around reviewing the fines and fees or the the fines on a comprehensive review of fines and finding consistency across bylaws, for example. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, that would that would take uh, some time. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm thinking about like 2024, like a, a bigger body of work yeah. um, I, that I'm just percolating in my mind because I'm, I'm just seeing now we've had a few 
where I, we're just uh, addressing that fine on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I would just add maybe Councilor Rutherford that I, I think if I think it's if we do one or two like this it might help us actually with some lessons learned for a, a, a greater body of work so okay. maybe I, I'm okay with one or two like this and and then if we um, start to see them coming in and then because I think we'll learn some th yeah. some things by that that we could then apply to a greater body of work so I think we could phase it perhaps yeah yeah and and I'm sure it will be identified in OB12 anyway as something Correct. to yeah. to look at I don't expect that work to happen right away absolutely I know you've got a lot already but it's just something I wanted to flag and, and note that I'm starting to see that pattern yeah, no, I, appreciate I that. think the other so that I call it the bylaw project but the three main bylaws and, and related ones that work is well underway we're already talking engagement so I, I wonder if what council wants to do is review where we landed on on that piece yeah and then and then use that as the launching pad to figure out what to do for well and I think from a governance perspective there's a bigger question question of you know what level of um, like fines are a tool that have consequences both positive and negative and I don't even think we've had that comprehensive conversation as a council um, you know I'll speak for myself the 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 tickets that my residents in a lot of my low-income neighborhoods received I'll be speaking point uh, Councilor Rutherford, you can right. speak, you can right, speak on right. that. Thank right. you, thank you for Ask calling me on that. I appreciate yeah. that, yes. Yeah. Questions? Okay, I am, I'm done. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Councilor Rice? <clears throat> so, uh, one question, and then, yes, we, we have different fund amounts for the different bylaws. Uh, what's the criteria was used at the first place when we determine the fund amount? for the different bylaw. Is there any specific methodology and in place already or are we are still explore that consistent approach? Well, I think, you know, uh, bylaws change significantly over time. I think we, we revisit fine amounts if, there's, if they're uh, effective. Uh, we look at juris other jurisdictions, so I think we're constantly reevaluating uh, the fine, fine amounts. And you know, uh, you did give us some direction on the three the three main bylaws as a part of that to look at the fine amounts and to look at the tools in our toolbox uh, beyond fines. So I think it's something that we're always evaluating. Uh, another question related is because the different bylaw cover a different scope of enforcement. So how our determination the amount of the bylaw reflect that scope of enforcement? Uh, is there any documentation or any existing policy already uh, to guide us to give the fine, to de define the amount? And instead of we just uh, doing one by one by changing amount. Well, I, I mean, I think we do, uh, we do look at our enforcement activities and whether they're successful and whether we, we can enforce in court if fines are, are provided and whether that makes sense. So I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a circular piece. We're constantly reviewing and whether, uh, whether they're successful. So I think every bylaw is different. Uh, fines are different in, in for, for different purposes. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. But. Um, then, then my question become: Is there do you uh, do you need any direction and how to make that alignment and between the fine amount and the scope of enforcement activities? No, I don't believe we do, Councillor, because we're kind of going to look at that as as we go through this process. And I, I think part of the difficulty in answering the questions is, is just because it depends on when the bylaw was put in place and when the fine was put in place there you know I can't go back and uh, and say hand on heart that we've used a particular process for all of those they've been different times in different places so um, I, I'm I think we're clear on what the intent is and I think it makes sense for council to understand sort of what methodology is behind any fine assignment um, or consideration so we we can certainly do that as part of our process going forward Okay, uh, thank you. That's my question. 
Thank you, Councillor Ray. So that concludes the questions on this. We're ready to vote. Councillor Wright, do you have any con conclu or anyone else to speak? If not, then I'm going to go to Councillor Wright. Uh, seeing none, Councillor Wright to, uh, no, oh, sorry. Right. Sorry, Councillor Rutherford, you want to speak? You're too quick. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, please. Yes, as you friendly as your friendly reminder that I was already speaking to the motion, <laughs> okay, I do want to speak to this. I will support this amendment uh, or this motion on the floor, but I do have concerns. Um, I first of all have concerns that we're starting to get a bit heavy-handed, whether it's with development industry or our residents. I feel like we're increasing a lot of fines, and there's some consequences to that. We have reinstated the loitering bylaw. We've increased fines for ticketing with snow removal. We already proved another one. I just, and I see this happening really ad hoc and, I, and I'm very concerned about the bigger conversation we have to have about the tool of fines and how we use them and when they are good tools and when they're not good tools. And so, um, you know, this is generating a report, so I, I will entertain that, but I do, want to you know articulate that to my colleagues that I do think we need to uh, if we're going to keep bringing amendments on bylaws forward related to fine increases that this will need to be a bigger a bigger conversation that we have on the values we want to to espouse as a council thank you thank you Councillor for that Councillor Rutherford for that uh, Councillor Wright to close uh, yes um, thank you Councillor Rutherford I, I do recognize and, and acknowledge that we don't want to just be fining people as a, as a source of revenue, as Councillor Jans has said, fines shouldn't be a source of revenue. And I, I look at it more to be as a, a deterrent um, or just to bring it to people's attention of what these bylaws are. And there's no sense, I guess, having a bylaw in place if we don't have the tools to enforce it. Um, but again, I don't want to see it as a revenue generator, more as a deterrent. And hopefully this will sort of encourage a, a greater body of work for, for all of our bylaws. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Before I go to the next one, I did check with the, our city manager if we can uh, uh, actually deal with 9.1 today. and. Uh, uh, be, uh, folks are available for us to uh, do so. Is Councillor Hamilton, could you move that we bring 9.1 forward and deal, or do we need to bring it what forward to make it, we need to make a time specific one, 130. That's all we need to do. Yep. Right. Um, yep. I'll move that we make item 9.1 now time specific for 130 on January 31st. Okay, got it. Second. The, second by Councillor Rice, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay. Uh, next one is 10.5, complete street design and construction standards. Councilor Nack. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, so I have the motion with just a few little word additions, so it shouldn't change much uh, for the restatements. I'll read it out. Uh, that the that through the review of the complete streets design and construction standards administration engage with stakeholders and evaluate the opportunities and impacts of implementing the following standards number one when reconstructing a road slash sidewalk multi-use trails will be the standard instead of sidewalks number two installing raised cross rocks crosswalks running parallel to arterial collector roads that intersect with local roads and at key locations in residential communities Number three, installing raised crosswalk crossings at all alley access points. Number four, requiring boulevards on all roads. Number five, curb extensions will be the standard at most intersections. And report back, here's the addition, with draft amendments as part of Integrated Infrastructure Services Report IIS 01428, Standards for Public Realm Infrastructure. Can we see that on the screen, please? 
Just give us a moment. Yeah, We're no just worries. cleaning that up and we'll yep. get it up. Here we are. Here we are. We need a seconder. Second. Second by Councillor Tang. Okay, Councillor Nack, can you please make the introduction? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mayor Sovi. This is actually something we've talked about for uh, a number of years. This, these conversations started long ago, and we've been making modifications and adjustments to the complete streets uh, design and construction standards, uh, which I think have improved things. But, uh, you know, I, I've, it's always been in the back of my mind that I think we need a bit more of a holistic change to that because we're missing out on a lot of opportunities that end up costing us far more to fix afterwards than if we actually just did it right the first time when we did it. Uh, I'll give one specific example. I think about the questions, the written question from the budget and Councillor Jans asked about the cost of building a sidewalk compared to a multi-use trail. And if you saw that written response, you saw that the cost is actually the same. So unless there's very technical reasons we shouldn't be doing it, why wouldn't we be building multi-use trails instead of sidewalks every time we're rebuilding something, as an example? From a traffic safety perspective, we are spending so much money on crosswalks and different traffic safety improvements and street lab and all of these things that if we just built it in clearly to when we're reconstructing neighborhoods, um, that I think we would see much greater saving up front, uh, or rather over the long term, because we're going to be building it right uh, the first time. And uh, so a lot of these things are happening across many other jurisdictions. Again, they're happening here, but not consistently. And that's that to me is what what is a bit frustrating that we don't have that sort of consistency and that consistent application across the city. One specific thing I want to flag, uh, I did have a conversation with representatives from UDI uh, either last week or the week before, and, and there was a bit of concern that uh, when applying this thinking of these changes to new neighborhoods, they were concerned that this would actually increase the road right of way. And to be very clear, that is not what I'm looking to do. I would rather us more effectively use the existing right of way in new communities as those are being built out. Uh, and again, address those safety uh, aspects right from the beginning instead of us having to constantly react. I think I only get two minutes for introduction, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Questions now, Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you, Councillor Nack, for bringing this um, idea forward. Um, I, I think it sort of takes into account maybe all the street labs uh, work that's been done that you've been promoting and encouraging residents, is that right? Correct. Okay, um, I'm just, one thing I am concerned about is the installing raised crossings at alley access points. Are, are alleys normally considered like intersections that would have a crosswalk or no, is this just something to be considered something to be considered because okay. as we know one of the challenges right now and, and snow removal is a perfect example is that even if residents clear their sidewalks on both sides of the alley the alley isn't maintained by the city that that crossing and so it becomes an area that is typically filled with snow and ice and so i'd like to see what what we might want to consider if when we rebuild alleys that they'd be level okay no i fully supportive of this. Thank you for bringing it forward. Thank you, Con Councillor Rice. Okay, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Um, to the mover, um, this is actually a very good motion. And then just wondering, when this motion drafts, is there any financial implication considered to be included in this motion? Great question. So I, that part of getting this report back uh, and, and is understanding where there might be cost uh, increases up front, also where there might be cost savings in the long term. I have some general ideas of what that looks like, but I'd rather have it in a clear report that shows that for all of us to have access to. So from my understanding and by reading this motion, just first time reading this motion, and that there are two costs that could be involved. One is the capital and the one is operating. So what I heard is those costs will be provided back to us and in the report. Correct. And, and part of it is, is to your point, uh, a lot of, if you did this, let's assume you went down a path and started doing this more, more permanently, that would be an upfront capital cost, but what might it save us in the operating cost that we spend every year on traffic safety installations and other types of 
of、uh, work that we do. So that's that's an example of that. So if that is the case, and then、uh, my understanding could be the operating cost will not impact the already approved budget, but the capital might be. Is that understanding correct? The、high level, yes. I, I, I think there are certain things listed here that potentially would have an upfront higher additional capital cost. But what I'd want to see in the report is where you would potentially experience savings,、uh, both in operational cost and then, frankly, just actual safety improvements for quality of life. Uh, so do we need to add that financial implication piece in the motion, or we don't need to? I think that's a question best for Min. I, I think that's part of the conversation,、um, but but I, I want to make sure that they they have that same expectation. Yeah, we would provide both capital and operating costs associated with any proposed adjustments、uh, related to the complete streets design and construction report that was originally planned to come, including these additions. Okay, thank you. That's my question. And if I might add on the costs as well,、um, Councillor Nack, I'm not sure if you want to make it explicit in the motion that there is not the intention to take more land and add costs to development. That's the expectation, and so if it needs to be written, fine. Otherwise, I, I trust that you would do that work, assuming that with that in mind. Would the administration prefer that be included in in the in the motion? I think well, it. If I could just add, the suggestion that all of this can be accommodated within current within current road right away、uh, limits is a stretch. So then it would come down to choices in order to accommodate all of these things. So if we get that specific direction that it's within a the existing standard footprint for a road right away width. Then it's going to be clearer in the report that any、yeah. decisions related to two multi-use trails will come with a decision related to reductions in other locations to accommodate. Got it. I think that will be good in in a, a, a direction for administration to be given by council. So you want to make that change, councillor、uh, uh, uh, Nack? You can think about that. I'll go to councillor Rutherford and、uh, sir, councillor、uh, Rice. Your、uh, You're done, right, Councillor Rice? Oh,、uh, I'm done, and then also if if Councillor Nack wants to add that, yeah, well, he'll he'll work、yeah. on the wording with the with clerk, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah.、Um, so my questions are more in alignment with with the the intersection with with public engagement around around this the intent of this motion. So if there's two parts, first of all. I guess to administration when you you read to engage with stakeholders, this is something that will have an impact on a lot of other areas and impact on future engagement at the localized level. So, what is your scope or intent of engagement、uh, as per this motion? Well, I don't anticipate that we would be doing broad public engagement. I anticipate we'd be doing. Directed, targeted stakeholder engagement. So, those that participate in building infrastructure at the city, um, uh, certainly uh, the reference to our internal stakeholders around、um, traffic safety and traffic calming, etc. But I don't anticipate, just based on the timeframes that we have,、uh, doing a whole scale、uh, public engagement on this. Uh, in terms of your second part of the question, so if we bring back a report and direction is provided to council that implement one of these, then our engagement, for example, with neighborhood renewal, it would be on the basis of the latest standard that's been、uh, approved. Yeah, that, that's council. that's what I'm concerned about because that's when we, you know, we we would so so much work on the council initiative on public engagement, and I guess to Miss Owen, Mrs. Owen. Catherine,、um, what risk do you foresee in having these standards, and then when we do something like neighborhood renewal, basically telling the community it is what it is? If they are perceived to be an improvement,、um, I think that there is little risk to that. What communities continue to、um, 
tell us is that they want clarity around the things they can influence versus the things they cannot. And so any opportunity to make it clear um, wh which conversations are plausible and which are not is a, is a good thing. But if we, if we did this, and let's say we implemented some of these, I mean, neighborhood renewal is essentially sidewalk and road reconstruction. So what level of influence would local residents actually have? Like, where would the opportunities be, let's say, if we did the curb extensions as a standard or the shared use path as a standard? I, I think this is the... Um, we'll have to articulate this in the report. Um, I don't want to call it negotiation, but during our neighborhood renewal um, activities, yeah. there are points of trade-off, discussion, you know, uh, decision points that we made within the, mm -hmm. within the right-of-way that we have and with the interest of the residents that are living adjacent to these improvements. And so does all of this happen? No, it does not, because when we engage with residents, there are some inputs that they have into um, the designs that we put in front of them. And they're, um, it's part of the engagement process that we go through in neighborhood renewal. If this were implemented, and I don't see, I, I think what the councillor, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but he's wanting to get some of this information back to see if this should be the standard going forward, understanding the pros, cons, risks associated with this, um, and us being allowed to provide that feedback before a decision is made. But yes, if we go in and we go down the path that this is all incorporated, it becomes less of a discussion point during neighborhood renewal because council policy says. Yeah, I guess to the mover, uh, what are your thoughts on kind of my line of questioning and anything you wanted to add uh, with your intention behind this and the scope of the engagement on this sure. motion? Yeah, so so council policy already says we do a lot of this stuff, but we're not doing it consistently. And, and my worry and issue is that we've done neighborhood renewal in a number of communities even in the last five years where we haven't consistently implemented this when we've been asked for it over and over again. And I think I look at something like Street Labs, which is now oversubscribed as, as, a, as a reason why that, that's been sort of our engagement. We've heard quite clearly from across the city residents saying we have problems and we're, we've been trying to come up with other uh, stopgap solutions and I'd rather build it into the, the initials. So I, that's why I'm not as worried about uh, individual public engagement for this motion, um, but rather stakeholder, you know, EFCL, UDI, and if, if some high level conversations. Because I think we have a lot of individual feedback at this point. Okay, thank you. I think I need another round. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Cartmel, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. So uh, I just want to understand from our administration, like this motion is not too pres prescriptive, right? Because I would be concerned if uh, this is seen as a direction, and then you come back with the uh, with the uh, draft amendments. Uh, and instead of giving us pros and cons and very and good analysis, then maybe at that time committee council can debate whether to move forward or not. That's correct. I think good discussions with the councillor when this was being crafted that we would bring this part we would bring this as part of the update that we were planning to bring back uh, in September, but but still a decision point on the basis of pros, cons, capital costs, operating costs. Um, another councillor brought up approach to public engagement. So it would be, yeah, it would be a decision point for council. Got uh, it. We would obviously have a recommendation that would come in the report. Yeah. Um, but then it becomes a council decision related to how far, how much, and what's set in stone versus what's a, a guideline or a consideration. Okay, well, that, that's, that's, that's good to know. Uh, because I was concerned about the last part, is it reported back with the draft amendments as part of the uh, integrated infrastructure report, right? So uh, if that's not, if that give you, if you think this is still broad enough, flexible enough, then I'm okay with it, right? Well, but so, so we, we would bring draft back draft amendments, but we also may in the report recommend that you don't advance those draft okay. amendments. Got it. Depending on 
our analysis and the work we do. Okay, good. Uh, on the engagement, uh, internal engagement, absolutely. Uh, but I hope there will be enough engagement with EFCL and UDI because there's a big, quite a bit of impact on, on some of the, uh, uh, the work that you're doing with them and also the road right away and all that, right? So I hope there's not going to be one conversation. There'll be enough conversations with at least UDI on that aspect, right? Yeah, and, and Stephanie has mentioned, I think there's already been some engagement okay. related to the potential of this motion with UDI. That would continue. Um, and then I, I just, I don't think we can do broad public engagement. On yeah, this I understand because, that. Uh, mm -hmm. We just don't have the time. That could be the that. next step if council wants to go in that direction, right? So, okay, got it. Okay, good. Uh, I will take the chair back. Turn the chair. And I'll go to Councillor uh, Paquette. Just to speak. To speak. Can you move the second round? No, I, I oh, so no need for second yes, round. You answered my okay, got it. Okay. All right. So that is it for questions. Now to speak to the motion. Councillor Paquette, go ahead, please. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, thank you to uh, Councillor Knack for bringing this forward. Uh, this is something that uh, we've been talking about for many years. And uh, it, it's just about um, you know, doing some of that background work, talking to uh, a lot of folks and getting the ducks in a row. So I uh, appreciate Councillor Knack really engaging in that. Uh, so the the point that, that is raised about uh, engagement is a good one. Um, a few qualms. Okay, first of all, Edmonton has won awards for for our level of engagement. We actually uh, lead the field in municipalities globally, um, and we're proud of that. That was a, a large part of work from Councillor Henderson. But uh, one of the things that he would warn about is that you don't want to get yourself in a position of paralysis through analysis. And sometimes it's unfair to take things to the public that are very technical and ask them to make an informed decision. It requires an enormous amount of education, which is fine. And we we can do that, but um, there's also the caution that uh, we have to pick and choose which things we actually want uh, people to actually have to engage in to put in that effort, uh, because it is a lot of work. Um, but we do want to do it. So no, no question about that. Just, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that we, we find that sweet spot and generally administration does and generally administration comes back to us with recommendations on how we should engage. So I really appreciate the points that were raised about that. Um, and I do appreciate uh, the concern. Uh, in this uh, instance, uh, this is not actually something that we have to worry about right at this time. Uh, that's a conversation we can have after this is uh, uh, the, the, the uh, reporting from this comes back. Um, so I'm looking forward to that conversation. I'm looking forward to the information here. The gist of this, uh, when all is said and done, is that people uh, want to be able to get around safely. And these are proven methods in uh, cities over and over and over again uh, that help to increase that level of pedestrian uh, safety. And actually for safety all around. It actually uh, helps to reduce collisions. So people in vehicles are more safe as well. So because that is a uh, overwhelming request from the city, I am extremely happy to support this motion. And again, thank you to Councillor Knack for doing a lot of the background work and bringing this forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Picard. Councillor Salvador. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thanks to Councillor Nack for bringing this forward. Uh, really pleased that Councillor Nack brought up consistency and the importance of consistency. Um, and I would also agree that these standards listed here are not a huge departure from what we're already supposed to be doing. Um, but while they're called the Complete Streets Design and Construction Standards. I think um, sometimes they're treated more as guidelines and, and there can be a, a degree of flexibility that I think is, uh, is problematic. So I would really look forward to future conversations on how to ensure these are truly treated as standards going forward. 
Um, and for me, you know, absolutely, this is about safety and accessibility and cost efficiency, uh, but it's also about equity. And I think there's an important equity component here because communities that have the capacity to extensively engage and advocate for a higher standard of design during neighborhood renewal are often higher income. And I think we risk seeing disparity in the quality of infrastructure that are going into our communities if it is up to community members who advocate for these forms of infrastructure instead of them being standard and consistent across the board. So I will uh, yeah, keep it short, uh, very supportive of this. It's in line with our safe mobility strategy, our vision zero goals, and I appreciate it being brought forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Salvador. Councilor Jans. Yeah, so I concur with everything Councilor Salvador said about you know uh, standards, not guidelines, but I guess my only hesitation here is we are taking on to some extent, we are taking on the onus of traffic safety as a municipality and, and taking that onus away from the actual auto manufacturers and the vehicles themselves. Uh, I would draw your attention to, there's uh, more and more articles coming out about the hidden danger of big trucks. And I'm sure some of you may have seen that meme on the internet of a, a truck in 1970, which could fit in a parking stall and have room to open the doors. And then a truck in 2023, that's absolutely massive. Some of them now, you can, they did a, they showed from the, the hood of the truck, there were nine children in front of it before the driver could even see the child. They are so big and dangerous. And this is being allowed by regular to federal regulation. They're allowing these vehicles to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So we can have all these little curb bumps, et cetera, but these huge vehicles will just glide over them into, into pedestrians. And uh, um, so by trying to say we can spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to make roads safer, at some point, you know, we can have the best water filtration, but if there is a company dumping poison in the water, we need to go back to the source here and figure out what's going on. And it's not just the size of the vehicles. There's an, another excellent article um, talking in the LA Times talking about how technology has made our cars a candy store of distraction. And it talks about the iPads on the dashboards, the video relays. Uh, if you go into modern Teslas and electric cars, I mean, they can, they can do all, 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 in, all sorts of in incredible things. But the result is... Um, danger to everyone else. So I, I'll support this, but like to at some point municipalities are going are going to need to say that, you know, we designed a parking stall to fit a vehicle. The modern vehicle now is having trouble fitting in there. SUVs are now more and more and more of the of the supply and and at, at some point we need to address the the root of this problem, which is which which is the the, the vehicles and the drivers. So I'll support this, but um Again, it's another area where we as a city are spending more and more money uh, picking up the slack for somebody else. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jans. Councilor Rutherford. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to all my colleagues that spoke before me so elo eloquently. I, I agree with a lot of the comments that were made. Um, absolutely. I love the idea of consistency. I love the idea that you know they're not just guidelines but actual standards my hesitation comes from you know my experience and knowledge in in the world of public engagement and one of the most important pieces that public engagement should add is public trust and it should enhance not erode public trust and that can come from consistency so I'm, I'm really torn because we could put in these standards and that consistency could create public trust because people know what to expect. And as uh, Mr. Lachlan said, we can be more clear on what the opportunities are to engage or not engage. So I'm not opposed to it. It could be beneficial. But I also would be not doing due diligence to, to, to flip that and, and highlight some of the cautions as well. And I think we have examples where we have done, you know, I think about bus network redesign. I think about city plan, where when we are going to make decisions that have long-term local impacts, we have engaged at a broad level. And so by not doing that here, that concerns me. And so what I was most hesitant about was the draft amendments, because what that means is in this process, that when this report comes back, we could just approve those amendments without consultation. And I'm very concerned about that. 
I, I think that in order to have that public trust, it just has to be done in a good way. And, and I think that the long-term local impacts of these decisions, even if they're the right decisions to make, need to have a broader conversation, and I think that's a step we're missing. So I hope we consider that when this report comes back um, and we think about those implications, because I'm not opposed to these ideas, and I'm thankful for Councillor Knack for bringing this forward. Um, but targeted stakeholder engagement is great when it's a targeted project or a targeted initiative. When you're talking about something that globally affects all of Edmonton and all of the neighborhoods. I think about 132 Ave, right? Already, even though there were standards, they don't even, they're guidelines. There were so many conversations that I had to have with residents that said, sorry, you couldn't influence that. That's already, you know, a council policy. I think about Dunluce community engagement coming up on neighborhood renewal. And I think about the local context of uh, one road that has the community league, playgrounds, and two schools. And maybe, maybe these are the best and most important things to be added to there. But what the value of public engagement is, is honoring and respecting local knowledge and context. And I wonder if, through this, we, we lose that piece. Because maybe these are the great the, the pass forward for that area, but maybe those residents have insights that that this design should be a little bit modified for that area, given the context of what's all there. Um, so I'm, I'm I will happily entertain this report, but that's why I think it's important to highlight those those cautions because I do think it again um, needs to be recognized that this will have long term localized impacts on these decisions that we make. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say appreciate Councillor Nag provide um, this motion and bring this motion for us to discussion. I do uh, appreciate other uh, points my councillor uh, brought up. At the same time, I, I would like to say from city perspective and then at a high level and also from our um, governance perspective, how we can use existing program to integrate some resources and some efforts, and then for additional work we have to, to do to address certain issues. I think that efficiency piece could be addressed through integr in integration and resources integration uh, integrate efforts and to reduce the burden at, at administration for certain work, for certain programs we already exist. And then we could look at it from continuous improvement perspective uh, instead of and bring additional new programs or additional new cost and into the budget already approved. So I'm really looking forward for this report, but I do want to mention this integration resources, integration efforts uh, in the process and in the work with the consideration of the city administrations uh, already the work there and in the system. Um, so looking forward to the report and I will support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Nack to close. Thanks, Mayor Sohi. So uh, I just want to give a few examples of, of why this, this has come forward uh, and recent examples. I think about, uh, I've started biking on uh, 51st Avenue to go to Alberta municipalities meetings and we built a new sidewalk uh, on that road when we could have uh, extended that a little bit further on the, on the north side of that street and built a multi-use trail. And now we are stuck with a sidewalk that'll be there for 50 years instead of having a multi-use trail um, to connect more people to more spaces. And I appreciate that there might've been in that particular case, a little bit more cost, but I think we should be leaning more towards doing that than not. Uh, the Valley Line West LRT, a personal failure of mine, uh, the fact that we don't have multi-use trails running along the entire Valley Line West LRT route is a failure of mine. I should have caught that earlier and I should have caught it, but I'd like to have policies so that 
I don't have to try to catch those things. Uh, I think about raised crosswalks in point two and how we know, and we've seen other cities that do have this, uh, how that provides better accessibility for those who are using mobility aids and safety, of course, for everyone using that those spaces. Um, right now, if you go out in the middle of winter, having to dip down into the road every time you have to cross a block, if you're in a wheelchair, if you're using a walker, if you're a parent using a stroller, it is not easy to do so. And we should standardize um, better service to those who cannot drive. And that doesn't really impact those that can drive. It all actually sends a good reminder that I'm entering into a residential community, so I need to drive more responsibly. Uh, Councillor Wright already asked about point three, but again, similar to the point in point two, every alley crossing right now, if you're using a mobility aid, is near impossible to safely navigate. Uh, it should be standard so that somebody in a wheelchair can actually get to a grocery store, get to a medical appointment in their community, and they can't right now because our city isn't designed for that. And I'd like to see that change. Uh, for boulevards on, on all sides of the roads, again, if you've been traveling through communities, as I'm sure most of us have, uh, while blading has occurred, you notice a very specific difference between communities that have boulevards and how the, the windrows are stored on the boulevard versus new communities that often don't have boulevards and have an even narrow, narrower, narrower, <laughs> a more narrow right of way. <laughs> That's a better way to speak. Um, that that affects things like on-street parking. Boulevards uh, allow for better management of snow, and it also around, uh, allows for more trees and uh, just more beautiful neighborhoods. Uh, curb extensions, th this is all about Vision Zero. Uh, this allows you to more safely uh, be visible to drivers if you're looking to cross. Uh, you know, I think about another example on the ward I represent when we rebuilt two roads in the community of Belmead, uh, two local roads in the community of Belmead that intersect a north-south path that runs through the entire community. Even when we reconstructed those roads and we wouldn't have impacted any vehicle traffic, we didn't put in curb extensions, which means now for the next 50 years, uh, that north-south crossing continues to be less safe than it could be had we just not built that in from the beginning. And sure, they're going to go down the path of street labs and we're going to install in some plastic bollards to do it, but we shouldn't have had to do it that way. So those are just some tangible examples of why we need to uh, more standardize the process versus leaving it more to guidelines. Um, and I, I do say, I want to, I, I do really appreciate Councillor Rutherford's point. And, and, you know, I, I think why I come at it from a different angle um, on the engagement front is because this is something I've been dealing with since I was on council. And I've been hearing from residents over and over and over again about how these inconsistent applications of our current standards uh, impact them. And so for me, having, you know, sat around here and, and heard those complaints, uh, you know, it's why street labs exists. Street labs exists because when a community in, in Hazeldean went and actually got two thirds of the residents to sign off on a slower speed limit, we said no, even though that was our policy. <laughs> uh, that, that did not do a great job in building up trust in that neighborhood as, as just one of many examples. And the reason we have street labs now is because we kept telling communities over and over and over again, yes, you have traffic safety concerns, well, you know, we might inspect it in a couple of years, um, but we don't really have resources to do anything. And so I'd rather build this in up front, but I very much appreciate, and I don't want to gloss over the engagement piece. So I, I, why I've asked for draft amendments is that we don't have to approve it at that meeting. Honestly, I'm tired after nine years of waiting. I would like to, but I, but I would, would respect that there is many new, call, I have many new colleagues who might want to run some of those ideas by, take a couple of months when that report comes back to make sure that whatever we approve is being done in a thoughtful way. So um, I'm pretty much out of time. Thank, thanks so much for, for the conversation and hope everyone supports us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Please vote. No, we're dismissing your vote. I'm, I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Next, we go to 10.6, Affordable Housing Strategy. Councillor Prince Bay. I just wanted to see if we wanted to do 10.1, since Councillor Stevenson is here now. We could do that, too, or we can come back at the end. 
Are you okay? Ten point one. Okay, got it. Proposal for short-term lease. Councillor Stevenson, ten point one. Uh, thank you so much, um, and I'll just restate my motion, which I believe uh, uh, Clerks has. Uh, that administration publicly offer the facility located at 11516 103rd Street, seeking a tenant who can demonstrate the financial means to maintain the facility at their sole cost, and provided a suitable tenant is located, that the city manager then enter into a short-term lease agreement with the suitable tenant in a form and content acceptable to the city manager. Okay, yes, hold on, let it... Uh uh, to be displayed on the second. screen, and we need a seconder. Mm -hmm. Councillor Tank, you second that? Okay. Councillor Tank seconded that. Here we go. It is on the screen. So, Councillor Stevenson, please introduce the item. Thank you so much. This is a site that's located in the Spruce Avenue neighborhood. Um, it is a parcel of land that the city had purchased a number of years ago um, uh, to provide publicly owned parkland in uh, the neighborhood. Uh, it currently has a building, it was previously a church, and for many years it's been operated by Workshop West for art space um, uh, and community use. Um, the uh, Workshop, oh sorry, yeah, um, Workshop West uh, recently moved to a new location, um, and Arts Habitat expressed an interest in continuing to use that building. But at the time, the city uh, administration moved forward as per our policy, um, with the intent of demolishing that that building for use as park space. So our policies are very strong and, and they certainly speak to the importance of having city-owned uh, park space in the neighborhood and I, I think the decision to acquire that land makes, makes a lot of sense in the long run. But in the short term, uh, the neighborhood itself is not experiencing any significant gaps in open space provision. Um, just adjacent to the site in question are two very large uh, green spaces, uh, which are held by Edmonton Public School Board. So in the future, we that space could be lost as open space. But uh, for, for the near to medium term, at least, uh, will continue to exist and meet the open space needs of the community. Um, in the interim, uh, keeping this building and not demolishing it provides the opportunity for an active community use, uh, which the community league and, and surrounding uh, residents support uh, the continuation of. A, a portion of the site where the building is located has already been converted to a community garden. Um, the community doesn't feel that they need further space that would be provided through the footprint of the building to be demolished. So recognizing in this budget that we weren't able to advance many new community facilities, I felt that this was a great, effectively no-cost option um, uh, for the city to maintain community space. Um, while I recognize there was a historic use by Workshop West and there was interest from Arts Habitat, I did want to make it an open tender so that all community groups across our city have the opportunity to express an interest. Um, they would be required to operate and maintain it at their sole cost. Um, but the expectations for maintenance, effectively we would allow the community... Only two minutes. minutes. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Yeah. I was just watching the clock. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. All right, questions, colleagues? Questions? Okay. Councillor Cartmel, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. I just have one quick question around the, the direction, uh, and this is to city manager. Say administration publicly offered the facility, right? Is the kind of, just want to understand, that's kind of too prescriptive in a way that uh, or maybe more appropriate, maybe administration explore uh, options to publicly offer? Because I, as you said, we don't want to be limited to one, right? Or does that give, I just want to get from Andre, does that give you, or I'm just kind of wordsmithing, right? Does that give you flexibility in that sense? I think that makes it clearer for the options if, if the uh, mover doesn't mind, it, helpful, I think. No, that's just okay. fine. So the intent would still be, you know, it's offered to a range of community groups who can put forward proposals for the use okay. of the space. Great. Yeah, so yeah, we could add that, that administration explore options, right? So, okay. All right, so that's all I needed to know, and I'll take the chair back. And the chair. And I'll go to Council Principal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just, I'm not sure if you said it, but what is, what would a short-term lease be considered? I, I might uh, turn to our, our colleagues in real estate who, who provided that wording. 
So a short term lease would be up to five years. And so we'd be looking at any term up to that amount. Okay, great. Thank you. And to the mover. So my understanding is that it was the intent was to uh, demolish the building and leave it as green space. But you say there is some green space there, which isn't city owned. And so, um, but ha just having it as a short term lease, then it would still be city property. And eventually later on, if there is a need for open space, it would be available to us. Is that right? That's exactly right. And I think that's the intent of the, the short term nature of the lease. So, so again, my, my prediction would be, it would be, it would be highly unlikely that the adjacent school site would be declared surplus, closed down, sold off and redeveloped uh, in, a, in a time frame that was shorter than five years. But that could happen in 10, 15 years. Um, so this, this allows us to hold that land in reserve so that if and when the open space requirements materialize, the building can be demolished. The intent is also that you know, the maintenance requirement of the building, it's effectively a run to ruin. Um, so we're not looking for community groups to make huge investments in this building because we know it will eventually be demolished, but it's, it's got some life left in it. Okay, great. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Principal. Councilor Wright. That was sort of where my question was going, is what condition is the building in? There is still some life left in it? Yes, and, and again, perhaps if, if real estate want to weigh in, my understanding from the community groups is they feel that, that it was really meeting their needs, that it was um, adequate for their needs, though from our facility ratings, again, uh, it would have needed some substantial uh, investments to meet, like, uh, to extend its life, let's say, for 20 years. But given that we don't want to extend its life, it would just be allowing them to use it while it remains safe. To the best of my knowledge, it's a, it's a perfectly secure and safe building for okay. use. Would Mr. Lachlan have some information on? I defer to uh, Bart. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I can just add a little bit. The, the building does require some investment. It is in a uh, condition C at this point in time. And so we, through this process, we would look for a tenant that can show and demonstrate that they can actually invest the necessary dollars to make it usable for their purpose and then enter into that short term lease. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Okay, so it's not D or F yet, it's still C. <laughs> okay, no. so. <laughs> all right, that gives me hope, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So that concludes the questions on this motion. Anyone to speak? Mayor, before we go into that, may I just please confirm the change that we have made to the motion to explore options at the beginning is yeah. okay with the assembly? Yeah, that's friendly. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, all right. Uh, anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Stevenson to close. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, just my thanks to administration for helping work through this. Um, again, the policies in place make a lot of sense uh, generally, uh, but I'm, I'm excited that we can explore this small exception uh, to enable the ongoing community use of a, of a valued building in the neighborhood. So I uh, encourage my colleagues to support and thank you all so much. Thank you. I know it's, oh, I forgot to ask, sorry, before we vote, the timelines for a report to be returning to council, court committee. Fourth, qu fourth quarter? Third I don't, quarter? I don't, fourth I don't expect a report back, actually. Okay, just, okay, got it. Okay, got it. okay please vote then. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now we are back on to 10.6, affordable housing strategy, cost of principle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to restate my motion, please. Okay, go ahead, please. That administration include in its in an upcoming report on the affordable housing strategy the following information. Community housing versus versus mixed market housing opportunities and challenges. And nonprofit daycare space partnerships in future builds and include people centered metrics. Uh, and Thank then, you. Just uh, hold on, Council Principal. Just to give me one second. Just uh, can can you please display it on the screen? I need a seconder in the meantime. I'll second that. I was just going to say, uh, as you suggested, maybe to uh, Q4 2023. Yeah. Second. Okay. okay. Oh, Council uh, Council Rice, you want to second that? Okay. Council Rice seconded that. Okay. All right. Q. Sorry. Q4. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Yes. Okay, yeah. got it. Can you please make the introduction? Yes, Pastor okay, Prince? thank you very much. So the reason that uh, I'm bringing this forward is that I had the opportunity to visit uh, mixed market housing. And uh, although I thought it, what a wonderful strategy, what a great idea um, to make it more sustainable, in reality, we weren't seeing that because the at market units were empty while we had an extremely long waiting list of people that needed affordable housing. So I just thought that maybe there was another way that we could approach the housing. And uh, it, was, it came to my attention that maybe we might be better to invest in community housing with um, a type of, of um, uh, way that we would keep the community together, have um, things like nonprofit daycare in, in order to create a, a more community-minded um, atmosphere. And I, I just, I know we have limited dollars and every dollar counts, so I thought that it might be more impactful this way. Uh, it is, and also the largest demographic that we heard from the Affordable Housing Strategy Report on October 11th is that the most housing needs were by, were single parents with children. And I think my time's up. Thank you, Councillor Prince. Councillor Prakat. Just to speak. Okay, to speak. Anyone else have any questions? Uh, Councillor Tang. Um, I guess to the mover, can you clarify what you mean by people-centered metrics? As opposed to um, in reports having how many units we're building, it's how many people we're housing. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering from administration, that first bullet, so we're currently with affordable housing strategy. We're not looking at community housing or mixed market housing or challenges or lessons learned and opportunities. Uh, we're still in the development of exactly what that is going to look like. Uh, we certainly focus our efforts on affordable housing, um, but it's hard to have that conversation without also having conversations about um, the housing spectrum, uh, which of course includes mixed mar market housing as well. Um, so I think that this would direct us to have sort of a re-emphasis in terms of how and what we talk about, um, but it is considered within the larger spectrum. So it is considered within the larger spectrum, right? I guess what I'm concerned about is more that we just recently passed another motion that also looks at lessons learned for the affordable housing strategy. I'm conscious there are, have, I don't know, half a dozen housing strategies. Um, and I, 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 I venture to say it's one of the heaviest area of focus right now because uh, we care about housing, of course. Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, what is the current plan for the strategy and what was going to be included, and would this be redundant? Uh, sure. So uh, I don't see the lessons learned in here, though. Yes, it's absolutely our intention to be including that lessons learned as per a previous conversation that we had uh, at executive committee. Um, we can certainly, uh, as I said, include a bit of a focus here on the community housing, on the mixed market, et cetera. Um, it will be a bit more work, but it's not outside of the scope of what could be done. Uh, so I would say that this is a re-emphasis, uh, what I think I'm hearing, and a little bit more of a dig in on these pieces um, that we wouldn't have otherwise had, um, but that can be considered. Again, it's, it's just simply a little bit more work to put that into the report. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. Um, and, I, and on that second piece, the nonprofit daycare space partnership in future bills, this is fairly specific. Um, I guess first to the mover, are you thinking more this is as a um, community amenities embedded into affordable housing bills? Yes, uh, the, the reason uh, is because with the uh, at market housing, as I said, the units were empty. So what can we do to entice people at market renters to uh, to dwell in these areas. I thought that, and you know, someone had given me this idea that maybe something like nonprofit daycare space right in the unit would entice at market renters. Right, and I, and I think this is often the model that, you know, I've seen many Savita housing have embedded nonprofit daycare 
space. So I guess I'm also just wondering, maybe to administration, would this piece be too prescriptive or granular, or is it about, you know, tapping into opportunities to fulfill those spaces with community amenities that could look like, I don't know, you know, lots of different options? Uh, well, I think you've you probably hit the nail on the head. There's there's lots of opportunities, uh, and this you know discussion could um, roll out in many many different ways. And so I think what would be helpful is an understanding from council in terms of what council would like to see us include. It's certainly possible for us to have some of those conversations, identify what those opportunities might be uh, for partnerships uh, with not for profit daycares within the space. Um, all of these conversations can happen. Uh, it simply is a matter of how how many of those conversations are are reasonable and doable within the amount of time that we have, um, and you know where would we want to go from that grounding of the affordable housing strategy to consider other opportunities. So the opportunities are endless. Yes, uh, we certainly can look at uh, the daycare within the space of that report if that is desired. Uh, again, it's uh, more work than we had looked at originally within the affordable housing strategy, but not anything that can't be done. Um, and typically when you do have, whether it's community housing or um, affordable housing, those conversations also do happen as a matter of course. Yes, of course. We support community housing. We support mixed market housing. All of these are options, and generally, Sorry, we for leave like daycare and um, these kinds of amenities, um, you know, exploring opportunities with providers and that kind of stuff. Of course. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I, I like the way that it, the motion is is prepared to include it in an upcoming report because I do recall us receiving, I think five reports on housing in one day and that they just seem to be all copy and paste for the basic information. Um, but I, so I'm just wondering the inclusion in the upcoming affordable housing report, is that due in October or is that coming to us before then? Quarter four. It, it is, okay, okay. So it will be the, the one and same report then. Um, and I guess, yeah, the more information that we can have all together included in that report, the better the better for us, so I, I support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Wright. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I, I think I'm just a bit confused with point one and, and administration's response because there was a motion that I made on the 22nd, or sorry, in 2022 on December 34, geez, October 31st around housing and homelessness and the revised strategy that administration incorporate the entire housing continuum from emergency shelter to market housing and the revised housing strategy to ensure a comprehensive systemic and interconnected approach to addressing housing and homelessness and that this includes work with the province and the federal government on response to immediate needs of those unsheltered individuals and transitioning into housing blah 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 does that not ca encapsulate is that not redundant to point one because you said that that was out of scope that this would help provide that scope but does that amend does that motion not do that? Uh, no, I don't believe I said that it was out of scope. I think, so in any of the work that we do, we support mixed market housing, we support community housing, and we really let proponents uh, lead us in terms of what they're interested in. When we're considering the affordable housing, of course we have to consider the, the entire scope, but in terms of the report, what goes into the report and where we focus on that, um, we take council's lead in terms of what you would like to see within the realm of that report. Okay, so can you, um, tell me from your understanding what is the difference between the motion that was passed in October and point one of this motion what is materially different that this would direct diff work so that we're also not contradicting each other in our motions so the intent of the report isn't quite to talk about the different models and to do a comparison of them but to take into consideration that spectrum, that scope, that need, and to identify what is required in Edmonton. I don't, the question I'm specifically asking you is about the, the motion on the floor right now. Point one says community housing versus mixed market housing opportunities and challenges. And I just read you the motion that passed on the October 31st. So I'm just trying to get a sense of with that motion, I read the first point as that's we're already we've already asked for that in October, and so I'm asking you: Is this materially different? Do you see this as different direction, or enhanced direction? I guess I'm just trying to understand what point one is in comparison to that motion and the council direction that you've already received. 
Yeah, so uh, exactly to your point in the October report, and I would say, uh, if anything, enhanced uh, direction. There, this seems to be more of a comparison between the two, um, which is, is you know, take these two models, look at them and compare the two. Um, that was not the approach we were taking in the others to do a, a comparison across each of the pieces, but to look at the spectrum as a whole. So, so to does your this point, count, does enhanced. that contradict? So does this one contradict? This? No, to, I don't believe that's what I'm hearing. I think I'm hearing a desire to deep dive into those two specific options and to provide a comparison of those within the scope of the affordable housing strategy, if I'm reading this correctly. Okay, and I guess to the mover, community housing is a very fuzzy term. It's not, you know, defined exclusively. Um, I'm concerned about if we're doing a deep dive into something, but we have different definitions of it. What could that create? Can you, can you speak to what your intent is around the community housing component of that? Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. So I was uh, in discussions with someone at Savita uh, to discuss what are our best housing options, their opinion of best housing options. And um, although the mixed market housing, as I said, I thought was a really great idea, sustainable, you know, sustainability is a great way, you know, to, um, use resources, but how successful it was, I wasn't sure. And it was recommended that possibly we might be better served to be uh, investing in community housing mm -hmm. as opposed to just, or as opposed to focusing on mixed market. Although with the mixed market, there is value in that. And uh, again, because of the sustainability piece. But what is your definition of community housing? Well, that's a good question. I don't know exactly how I can um, myself define it, but I do know that um, that was the term that was given to me by someone in the industry. Okay, so to administration, in quickly, what, how would you define community housing as per this motion on the floor? Uh, I think rather than defining it within this room, I would encourage a conversation with the with the stakeholders, with the city, and with council to ensure that we're all on the same page, uh, rather than predefining and pre-assuming. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So we have more questions on this item, and we uh, colleagues to speak. So we will stop here. We do have a one thirty time specific item on the agenda, which is a labor relations update for which we need to go into uh, uh, in, in camera. So we move at this time that when we come back, we go into, uh, move now that we will go into camera when we come back. So Councillor Hamilton, can you do that please? Uh, I will move that. Uh, we go into private subject to sections 24 and 25 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Okay, second. need a second? Second. Councillor Stevenson seconded that. So please uh, vote. We have all the votes. All right. Display the votes, please. Thank you so much. So we'll come back in camera at 1.30. Sorry, Cheryl. You have to come back.
We are live from City Hall Chamber. We are back in uh, public. I understand there is a, a motion. Okay, who would like to move the motion? I'll move that attachment one be added to the January 31, February 1, 2023 Employee Services Verbal Report ES01695 and that the actions outlined in attachment one of the January 31, February 1, 2023 Employee Services Verbal Report ES01695 be approved and that the January 31, February 1, 2023 Employee Services Verbal Report ES01695 Remain private pursuant to sections 24, advice from officials, and 25, disclosure harmful to the economic and other interests of a public body of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Okay, need a seconder. Second. Second by Councillor Knack. We have a motion on the floor. Please vote. Just waiting on one vote, Councillor Salvador. Yes. That was sorry. Those yes. Yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried nine to four. Okay. We are back on item 10.6, Affordable Housing Strategy. Uh, motion from Councillor Principe. And I think there was a speaker's list. Uh, Councillor Paquette was to speak on this item. And Councillor Rice, you had questions, right? Go ahead, please. So my question, uh, the first question is about the empty rate and for the marketing housing. And do do we have that specific data to demonstrate affordable housing and in our city and then right now on the market, but it's empty? Uh, just to clarify the question, Councillor Rice, you're asking yeah. for uh, the number of affordable housing units that are currently empty on the market? Uh, yes, at, at, at the market value. And because right now we're talking about uh, market value housing and then what is that empty rate? Uh, so you're looking for the vacancy rate of market housing? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't have that number. I'm not sure if uh, others within the organization would. Yeah, so if we don't have that information, we can follow up on offline for that information. For me to, uh, why I'm asking this question, I want to provide some rationale. And because we're talking about the community housing with mixed market housing opportunities and challenges, I would like to understand what's the current state for our city's affordable housing at market. Well, I think that if this motion passes, we would, you know, provide that information in the report itself. Um, that might be where it's maybe better suited. Um, then the follow-up question is, is it ratio? What is the ratio between the marketing house, marked by your house, and the community housing? Do we have that ratio? I don't have that on me right now, Councillor Rice, but I could see if I could find that. And specifically right now, and because many, uh, many uh, development actually contains two streams of housing, and then even with the same building, and we have the marketing housing in the same building, and we have affordable housing. So I would like to know the ratio overall and across the city, and the, this is, will give some like, data for us to make this decision, for me at least. 
Yeah, thank you for the question, Councilor Rice. I, you know, I think the, the, the crux that I think I hear you getting to is general ratio between affordable housing and market housing. Yeah. That's going to look different um, in any mixed-use building. Uh, often the approach there is to try to offset uh, the costs of affordable housing with some of the market housing in a same building or perhaps sometimes across a portfolio. Um, so there isn't one standard within a mixed-use building. Uh, we could certainly look across the city at uh, what... Um, market units uh, and ratio to affordable units uh, is, we could certainly include that. So for me to ask this question, because we're talking about in this motion and for the long profit daycare space and partnerships in future builds. So to understand what's current ratio that will support and how we identify those type of spaces could be used for the long profit daycare. daycare. So that's why I ask certain questions and for me to make a decision. And if we don't have this two data here, and then I'm happy to follow up with you offline and to get better understanding. Uh, but overall, uh, this motion, I think, provide an opportunity for us to explore the certain opportunity to look at what the spaces and in the affordable housing um, that's big um, envelope, envelope, and to looking for the community housing and versus marketing housing, and also to looking for some like long profit daycare spaces, and in the future so, development. Right, so you're, you're speaking here to now. Okay, yeah, yeah I'm <laughs> I'm stopped there, yeah. and that's my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I'll just say, Councilor Rice, that you know, ha as we're preparing to, you know, do our best to help with motions pending, we we don't do a lot of sort of detailed analysis to prepare no. for this discussion and answer some of those kind of detailed yeah. questions. We we kind of. You know, our practice is because we just don't have the time to do all that analysis and be ready for any potential questions you come up. That really comes if the motion passes, then we do those kinds of pieces of work. But we'll do our best to to answer what we can. But we're just not fully prepared to, yes. to answer I all the understand. questions. Understand, and specifically, we just passed the budget, and then then Christmas, and then your team worked so hard to get the, the first updates you provided last week. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Cartmel, can you take a chair, please? Can I take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. I just need, uh, uh, I think, over the last uh, year or so, we had a number of motions related to housing, right? And I think that's why it's kind of hard to keep track whether similar motions are being brought forward or there are contradictions within motions, right? I think it would be nice if we can kind of compile all of them together and maybe look at all of them in one meeting or some, or some way, right? Then uh, get a good understanding where where we are on this, right? Maybe, am I, and any comments on that? Uh, yeah, and that's definitely the, uh, the approach we're taking. That's why any of these uh, sort of subsequent motions or additional or enhanced motions, uh, we are asking that they all come together for Q4, where we were planning on bringing our affordable housing strategy forward. So, so other motions that are pending will come together on October 30th and all kind of in one. That's big, the plan. Big, big. Yeah, I would also add, uh, Mayor Sohi, that, you know, as, as you know, there's there's federal announcements and federal programs that are yeah. being developed as we speak as well, and we, we want to make sure we understand those. And we're obviously uh, doing a lot of work in the region right now among city managers to, yeah. to work together on that. So there's just a lot, you're right, there's a lot of inputs. I mean, it's, it's good because there's a lot of focus on housing, which is yeah. excellent. Uh, but yeah, we do need some time to sort of correlate everything and compare and contrast to make sure we're okay. bringing, a f you know, a full, full, uh, good project together okay. at the council. And maybe part of that conversation when we will have in October a um, little bit more clarity on, I know, houselessness, housing affordability, affordable housing, even though they're inter interconnected, but there are certain responsibilities that we don't have in certain areas, other order of government have, like understand affordable housing is a shared responsibility. But when it comes to shelters, when it comes to uh, you know, dealing with houselessness, that is provincial responsibility. I think having some little bit of clarity on that, do that, we have that conversation, because I think a lot of that is kind of mingled together. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so we'll draft that clarity for sure. Okay, got it, okay. All right, so that is it, I'll take the chair back. Attorney, the chair. 
All right, so that concludes the questions on this item. Now to speak, uh, I will start with Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I, I want to thank Council Principe for bringing this forward because I don't see this in any way as a duplication. Um, I see it as a clarification. And uh, I think that this will actually help to focus things because there are questions around affordable versus attainable housing and uh, different ways that we get there. I think that what this motion does, it also allows us to open up more of those conversations with transparency and, cl and clarity and more precise uh, in our communications with both the public and with the provincial and federal governments about housing. And uh, on a personal level, uh, you know, my mom for a time was a single mom with five kids, didn't know what to do, knocked on the doors of the neighbors. Eventually they formed their own nonprofit daycare. And uh, it, it was such a boon to the neighborhood. People were able to get a second job or even get a job. Uh, people were able to go to school and get an education um, or just relieved some of the stress and worry that people would have and save them money. And so when I look at this motion, I think like this is exactly the kind of thing that uh, we need and we can tackle at least on an information basis uh, at the city level. And uh, if, if we can um, keep this conversation going and we bring this all together through in, in one like mega housing meeting, that it might be that case, but th there will be a lot of very, very excellent information for not just council, but uh, all of our helping organizations and other levels of government and other elected representatives, if they choose to read it, uh, to gain an understanding of the issue that goes beyond partisan politics, goes beyond talking points, and goes beyond message boxes, and actually focuses on what the community needs. And so with this addition to what we are already working on, um, it's got my full support. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Rice to speak. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, thank you. And specifically, I want to take this opportunity to say um, um, thank uh, city administration and specifically, and because this is first meeting after uh, the holiday season, we come back. First, the council meeting. And I, I know we still have lots of things. And thank you, Mayor Sohi, about uh, your chair and then try to keep us and back to our normal process as well. Um, so I would like to say, like, based on by asking these two questions, I really think this motion and will provide us that opportunity for us to look at uh, all the information, all the data for us to develop that or enhance that affordable housing strategy. Because this strategy is so important for Edmontonians, and not only for Edmontonians, also for our developers, and for that industry area to understand, and some data to understand what the data tell, what type of story, and those type of story actually give us the future vision what affordable housing will look like in our city. So I think there is no. Uh, repeat effort here. We want to make sure and all the information to be included when we develop that strategy. So I encourage my colleagues to support this motion. I am definitely to support it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I'm inclined to want to support this motion because I understand the intent of it and I understand, you know, what we're trying to get at here. But I also have to weigh right now, you know, we have a city manager that's talking about how many motions and how much work and OP12 and what value does this add to the already existing motions we have related to the housing strategy and does it conflate or start to make that a little bit of 
a high, an expectation that's unattainable for administration to reach for what that strategy can and should be. So I am going to not support the amendment on the floor, not because I don't think it's it's got value. I think that we already have something on, on child care space and I think that that is a broader conversation even outside of affordable housing. But I I think we we need to let, at some point we need to let administration do their work and we've given them guidance on the housing strategy and that hasn't even come back and we're adding more to their plate. So for that reason, I can't support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Councilor Principe to close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you everyone for your comments and the conversation. Uh, I just wanna say that what motivated me to bring forward this motion was uh, when I went to visit affordable housing, uh, mixed market housing, and I heard that most of the uh, at market units at the time were open and we had such a long list of people waiting for affordable housing. I just thought that it was my duty to bring something forward, to bring it to the attention that this, there might be a disconnect there, that there's something that's possibly not working and maybe could be working better in another aspect. And as someone who has, you know, as a youth lived in affordable housing, I know its value, I know how important it is and how much it helped my family. So it is something that's very important to me. And as, as in uh, regards to the daycare space, the, the point of bringing that up was because of somehow enticing at market renters to be um, using those units so that it can be more sustainable. And just you know, trying to bring forward some ideas. That was the whole intention of this motion. So I do hope that uh, you would consider supporting it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, 10.7, surplus to school sites, Councilor Prince Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Boy, when I brought these forward, I didn't realize I'm gonna have to do them all in a row, right? <laughs> Maybe we should change that up. Okay, so the next one is surplus school sites, and I did have uh, a change to the motion, uh, wording of the motion. So I will just say that now, that administration not begin any new offerings to sell any surplus school sites, excluding the first place program surplus sites and those allocated to affordable housing. Bullet two, undertake a review of all surplus school site policies and provide a report with proposed options for use of surplus school sites, including remaining as open space using as urban gardens or possible future school site. Okay, can we uh, get that on the screen, please? Yes, we are just making sure we have the language right and we'll get it up right away. No problem. And we do need, I understand, probably want to see. Yeah, we we'll, we'll a get a seconder. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. Here we go, it's on the screen now. Councillor Principe, can you please make the introduction? Sure, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, my point of bringing this forward is that my concern is that we're um, anticipating a population of two million people uh, and we are looking to sell the surplus school sites, which I am concerned may possibly be needed in the future. Uh, I know that it's an ongoing thing that we're, there's always discussions about it. And I do understand, again, you know, we just talked about affordable housing, the need for affordable housing, and that's why I added that into there. Um, but I would like to consider uh, pausing it and making sure I, I understand that administration is coming forward with 
uh, a report in March to Community and Public Services that uh, might be discussing this. So I would like to just put a hold on it so that we can be certain. Because as we've seen at another site, um, with the St. Andrews site, it was an issue, it was a concern. So I'm just trying to prevent any seeing any concerns like that uh, coming up in the future. Thank you, I think my time's up. Thank you, Councillor. No, you have 58 seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> So, how was your holiday? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Councillor Hamilton, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Ms. McCabe, uh, uh, Councillor Principe referenced uh, a forthcoming report, I believe it's coming in March, um, the Joint Use Agreement Land Review Update. Uh, and I w Is that you? Or is that, no, that's someone else? You can probably ask that question of Mr. Jiraki, who's on the line. Ah, okay, all right. Um, Mr. Jiraki, uh, my apologies, I'm never sure where the where it sits, but um, uh, I know that the motion, that that report is going to be a response to the motion about aging infrastructure renewal, but I'm wondering if you could maybe provide some uh, context for um, uh, if, if some of the questions the councillor is proposing be answered. Uh, in a review are already being looked at? So, yes, so to answer the question, the first part is some of the work that we're currently doing right now with regards to surplus school sites is working with the various school boards to come up towards a long-term strategy of how do we operate together in a mutually beneficial way. That work, we can provide an update through this report that's being referenced here. I do believe that the report is a, is a urban planning and economy report, but we don't have any issues if, if we can provide an update through that in terms of the context of the work that's been going on uh, with regards to the joint use uh, agreement and the land management committee specifically that we're involved with within real estate. Okay, thank you. And, and maybe now to Ms. McCabe, um, the question of the, I, it's a really technical question, how you fit two million people in a city that currently holds one million people. Um, uh, the, the, this is coming up in the technical, like a, as a technical question again and again, and I'm, I don't expect that you'd be equipped to answer it now, but is that something that you already have the information um, within sort of your existing resources to be able to answer? Uh, we do in terms of some of the technical studies that were done for city plan at the highest level the concept is that we need to densify our city and have more infill opportunities uh, within our city mm -hmm. uh, to meet that two million. Um, and, uh, and so I would imagine a conversation about the use of surplus school lands would be a tension point within those, that conversation given maybe some of the challenges in terms of essentially getting, finding new land in infill areas. Potentially that could be the case. Okay. Um, was that a consideration as part of the technical studies? Did you, did you or, or were school sites considered sort of fixed assets? They were most likely considered fixed assets because we have policy direction for that. So okay. we used existing policy direction that we wanted to build into the city plan. That would not have been something that we explored uh, in that level of detail in development of the plan. Okay. Um, and then uh, maybe to the mover, um, the uh, you're proposing a moratorium essentially on surplus school site development, some of which, in my quick sort of perusal of school sites, some of which is allocated to seniors housing, some of which is allocated to first place or other affordable housing initiatives, some of which is not allocated at all. Is your intention to see a permanent moratorium or a, long, a longer term moratorium or would you be uh, amenable uh, to, um, uh, I don't know the, sorry, I don't know the the uh, horizon for dis disposition of any surplus school sites, but would you, um, considering that many of these questions might be asked or asked in, or answered, I'm gonna say in that uh, presentation on the 20th of March, would you consider withdrawing the motion and then um, I believe you're gonna be sitting on Community Public Services Committee replacing that motion if these questions aren't adequate answer to your satisfaction at that time? I would be, if I could ask a question to administration. 
would there be any sales, any lands going up for sale? I, in I, that? Uh, that, I mean, maybe that's a good question I can ask. Is there any, Mr. Jiraki, is there any plans to dispose of the land before the 20th of March or to put land up for sale? To put land up for sale, no, not before the 20th of March. We do have existing agreements that are moving forward as is, and so those would continue to move on, but uh, we could withhold on listing any property until that time. All right, thank you. If, if I could just add, councillors, as well, that... Um, Catherine and I had a very excellent discussion recently with all the superintendents of the school boards to talk a, a lot about this and make sure that uh, we're uh, working together on the city building. So I think we'll answer a lot of questions that are related to this through that, that process as well. And we've agreed to sort of uh, do that um, over the coming months. So I think we can tie that in, which would be helpful. Yes, then I would be amenable to that. Okay. All right, so Councillor Principe is willing to withdraw this at this time. Then uh, need be in March, you can uh, reintroduce that. Uh, so that probably means we don't have to go through the question. Is everyone okay who signed up not to ask questions now? Okay, all right, so uh, is everyone okay to put with the withdrawal of this motion? Please nod your heads. Okay, Councillor uh, Paquet, say yes or no. I am a okay with that. Okay, thank you so much. So motion is withdrawn. Thank you, Councilor Principe. Now next was, uh, is again you, 10.8. Uh, new urban trees. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I can read it in now, Mr. Yeah. Mayor? Okay. Um, that administration... Oh, that... City operations report to include an update on city's engagement, implementation, and accountability, accountability with regards to naturalization efforts. Second. Thank you. Second by Constable Paquette. Can you please make the introduction, Constable Principal? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So it's a concern that I've heard over and over again from residents is the naturalization implementation. Uh, and also... Um, trying to get an understanding of who's responsible for what are is it city responsibility are there contractors uh, in play here and we just I see a disconnect on the plan and the actual implementation as it appears to residents and you know I did bring forward a motion trying to increase uh, mowing cycles uh, which I know wasn't really a part of the plan of naturalization but I'm hoping that with this motion, we can at least find some uh, common ground and find um, a way to make those areas look a little bit more kept. Uh, I just want to ensure that we're not just not mowing the areas and we're actually implementing the plan as uh, discussed. So that's the point of uh, bringing this motion forward. Thank you, Councilor Principe. As far as the due date, March 21st, 2023, is concerned, that aligns with the March 21st, 2023 city operations report coming to uh, to the committee. Just want to understand, is that doable because I or without impacting the work on OP12? Uh, Mr. Mayor, that work is part of uh, the work we already are uh, undertaking in terms of the review of the naturalization program and the plan. So that would be all part of uh, work we have underway. So this should be doable. Oh, okay, so you're already they're already undertaking this work, right? So you're already right, so that I'm um, so this work is underway now. Gold. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, the work has been underway and there's been uh, extensive engagement that's been taking place in terms of development of the plan as well as uh, uh, engagement in regards to uh, informing uh, citizens of the naturalization program. So all, all within uh, the scope of what we're doing. So in that, in that light, is this, is, the, is this necessary? If maybe going to constantly. Uh, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for asking forget. that. Uh, you know what, as, as I'm not as concerned, believe it or not, with the engagement because I think the engagement has been quite good. I'm just not sure if the implementation has been followed through how it's been intended to. And I just, 
I'll give you an example. I had many I had uh, many concerns from people about um, the back of their fence. There was no there was no mowing, and um, they were told it's a part of naturalization. And the city went out to check it, and they said, "Yeah, it's all good. It's part of naturalization." And then went back again and said, "Oh wait, no, this had to be done. Uh, we needed to mow a strip here." So I just want to get clarification. Is it contractors? Is it city? Where's the disconnect uh, to the plan and the implementation of the plan? So that was the point of bringing this forward. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Councillor Paquet, go ahead, please. Just to speak. Just to speak? Got it. Okay. No more questions? To speak? Oh, sorry, Councillor Rice, questions? Mr. Mayor, if I could just interrupt for a second. Uh, Councillor Principe, I heard the statement of the motion is slightly different than what we have in the motions pending, and I believe I heard the intent to be the same, but I just want to confirm that you are okay with what we have up on the screen. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, yeah, that... That's, that's what we have stated at the, uh, at the budget meeting. Is that different from uh, what do you have, Councillor Principe? Uh, it's, it's very similar to what I have. So you're okay with what is on the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank okay. You. All right. Councillor Rice, questions? Go ahead, please. That's actually is my first question <laughs> because it's slightly different what I heard and then what's on the screen. Um, my next question. Specifically, and for the implementation piece, do we have the certain response in place to address the concern and from residents in the literalization area? And because the literalization area is already impact and impact some residents area. That is why the people come back or contact their counselor, even including myself. I got many times contacted. And then in the residential area, uh, they're mourning and because it's not, was not done due to its, due to its naturalization area, but it's really impact the residents. And then how we address that type of concern? And then is there any way during this review could include that response to address those type of concern? This type of concern is really common. It's not just rare one or two. And for certain area, I can provide some examples. It's already become an entire community concern. So, Councillor, I think uh, we paused adding any new areas uh, in terms of naturalized areas last year uh, following discussions with Council in the fall of 2021. What we committed to doing was doing engagement and updating the plan to uh, reflect more uh, of what citizens were looking for and their understanding of what naturalization was all about. So that's really what we're bringing forward is an update to what we would uh, see as a potential new naturalization plan, which will take into account some of the considerations that you've just identified in terms of feedback from citizens. Based on that discussion, then we would have some revisions to the plan, conduct additional engagement, and then the plan would be implemented. So we haven't actioned any new areas in the last probably 18 months, and we wouldn't until we get the plan updated and approved. Uh, or this reflect and some area in which uh, negatively impact the residential area uh, be changed from lateralization area to the long lateralization area in the community. So again, that will depend on what comes for, forward in terms of the next generation of the naturalization program and plan. And again, that's all based on what we're hearing back from citizens. We would have that conversation with council as part of this report. And from there, we would finalize the report and the plan going forward. So based on what we heard from citizens, if there are uh, 
you know, areas where uh, there's a desire to um, not have naturalization but have manicured or groomed uh, areas, that would all be included in this body of work. Uh, I would I would want to clarify this one more time, and then our uh, residents and in general the work on uh, we have better green spaces, lateralization area. I think the concern is not about we should have or not have, is about if we have, how our city demonstrated that responsibility to ensure those lateralization area will not impact their daily life in the community as a residential area. I think that is a point. And at this point, I, I believe I repeated over and over a few meetings and including today. I'm really looking forward to see this report in, could include and some uh, tools, some strategies, and to address those concerns from our residents. So as part of the, the plan, going forward once we begin uh, implementing uh, prior to that we would have uh, a communications and an engagement plan that would be intended to help residents understand what we've agreed to uh, in terms of going forward with the plan so that would help people understand what naturalization is what areas would qualify for it which ones wouldn't okay we have the specific definition and in that will be in that's included in the body of work that we're doing so the okay. naturalization plan also comes with an engagement and communications plan so when the new naturalization program is rolled out there is an accompanying plan to help residents understand what Got naturalization okay. is okay thank you my time is out thank you councillor rice councillor uh, councillor Paquette is to speak anyone else seeing no more questions to speak councillor Paquette, please go ahead hey. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not be taking the full five minutes. Uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, we've heard repeatedly, and I believe Councillor Cartmel has raised this as well repeatedly, and that is that uh, the way that naturalization is rolled out, unfortunately to a lot of people, simply looks like neglect. It looks like you, you know there isn't an actual plan in place except for let it grow, um, it's unmanaged, which is fine in, in many areas, but part of the effort here is to get people on board with a more permaculture approach. And I worry sometimes that when we say naturalization, uh, we just, you know, the public hears whatever, hands off, lazy fair. But the permaculture aspect means that there are intentional decisions being made about what plants are allowed to grow, what plants are growing, and the impact it has on cost savings and maintenance savings and uh, increasing the biodiversity, especially the natural di biodiversity of our area. If we do not do this intentionally, and this is why I'm supporting this motion, because every chance we get to intentionalize the policy is a good one. If we do not do this intentionally, we will lose the public, we will lose the thread, and you can say goodbye to a uh, naturalization effort for another generation. And I'm worried that that is what's happening now, and I don't blame administration. I think that maybe council policy and direction has not been crystal clear enough on this issue. And so if this makes it more crystal clear in the report that's coming, that's great. And I, I, I believe that if council votes for this motion, council is sending a very clear signal about what our policy expectations are. And that can only help administration because that lack of clarity leads to frustrations that really should just be borne on council. Clarity is kindness. So let's make it very clear with this vote. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Principe to close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to close by saying that I, I do agree with uh, naturalization. I think it's a great thing for our city, for the people of the city. 
but I just am not sure if the implementation is going as we had intended and we're envisioning. So I, and, and that's what I hear from residents saying that they don't see it as they had expected it to be. Uh, as well, the comment I made earlier about the complaint I had, the reason I brought, and I get people make mistakes, <laughs> I understand that, and I have no problem with people making mistakes, I know I do, but uh, what I want to clarify is that I just want to make sure that we're implementing it properly and we know who's responsible for what. If we do have uh, city staff and we do have contractors working on it, we just need to have clarification so that we're making sure that we're, we're following through with what we, um, what we have told residents that they're going to be seeing. And that includes planting of um, the natural uh, plants that we would expect to see there. So I do hope that everyone supports this. And thank you, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Principal, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried, now we are on to 10.9, Chinatown Strategy, Initiatives and Progress, Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Uh, this, I believe, is just the original wording that administration work with the Chinatown Transformation Collaborative and report annually highlighting initiatives and progress on the Chinatown Strategy. Um, so this was uh, subsequent to us approving the ongoing funding of the uh, Chinatown Transformation Collaborative uh, organization. Um, to this point, we haven't had a formal check-in or accountability mechanism in place. So the intent of this motion is just to have an annual report where we can check in with that group that we're providing funding to um, and see how we are going uh, with the Chinatown strategy. I think that's about it. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. I'll second that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I forgot to actually get it. Second, I second it. Uh, the due date, probably June 23rd is too early because uh, it's just a... Uh, being implemented, I mean, we just allocated the funding, so maybe fourth quarter? Whatever works best for administration. Fourth quarter, yeah. right, okay, Great. fourth quarter, uh, 2023. Okay, any questions, colleagues? Councillor uh, Tang? Yeah, so we have been given, giving funds to the society for some, t for the, to the collaborative for some time, is that right? It has been a number of years. I don't have the number right off the top of my head. Do they currently provide an annual report to administration, perhaps? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, we have regular meetings with them, uh, but I'm not sure if there's a, a formal annual report. So to know that, um, I guess for accountability mechanism, to know that they have spent, you know, they, that they're moving the strategy forwards through these regular check-ins. That's correct, Councillor. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm happy to speak to this. Thank you, Councillor Tang. No more questions on this. Uh, now to speak. Councillor Tang, you want to speak? Go ahead, please. Yeah, very much appreciate Councillor Stevenson for bringing this forward. Um, when, you know, I think Chinatown revitalization is something that has been happening for many years, uh, well before many of us were even elected to this council. In the past couple of years, you know, the, the, we've seen the culmination of social disorder and tragedy has sent us into a fury of seeking immediate and band-aid solutions and with one task force after another. And while all of this is important, I think in the meantime, I think some of the strategic long-term work has fallen to the wayside. And so refocusing on the Chinatown strategy, which took significant amount of energy and time from administration and community members to co-develop it, I think it's a good guiding document and I think it's a positive step. The Chinatown Transformation Society has been tasked with, with leading this seminal strategy. It's a new emerging organization, and with that comes with growing pains, as we've heard during the budget um, public hearing. And in the past several years, I've had actually quite a bit of concern about the organization's ability to store public dollar in executing the strategy in terms of governance, the leadership, and the execution. These concerns have not subsided, and I think this is a good motion to strengthen the accountability directly with this council who has expressed that Chinatown is a priority. Um, 
I don't, I don't think that there has been much in the past, and I'm glad to see that there's a dedicated resource, um, you know, on the administration side, it's not just off of the planner's desk. We have dedicated resource now, we have significant funding, um, and I want to be sure that, you know, those dollars are going to where uh, they're meant to go to. Um, thank you very much for bringing us forward. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Stevenson to close. Uh, no, thank you. Um, I look forward to having these opportunities to advance the, the strategic work, as uh, Councillor Tang mentioned, and, uh, and the opportunity to check in on, on that progress and how our funding is being spent. So thank you. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, 10.10 or 10.10, .10, assessment growth into strategic priority areas. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll start by restating this motion for a bit more clarity. Uh, so the administration outlined how education tax room has been used in the past and provide options for a future approach to fund strategic priority areas like housing, climate change, and other programs as part of the 2023 Spring Supplementary Operating Budget Adjustment. Okay, we'll wait it till for to be displayed on the screen. I need a seconder. Second. Councillor Neck. Okay. Councillor Stevenson, can you please introduce the motion? Thank you. Uh, in spring SOBA last year, I noticed that the education requisition levy requirements had decreased by 0.5 and close to 5% for residential and non-residential properties, respectively. This was because our assessment growth, um, you know, our new taxes collected, exceeded the increase in the education levy requirements. Digging into this deeper, the difference between the assessment growth and the education requirements represented about $20 million in funding. And while we could have collected that 20 million and still stayed within our 1.9% tax increase, the SOBA report came forward with the assumption that these funds wouldn't be collected and that the overall tax rate was instead reduced to 1.27 and 0.73 respectively. My motion is intended to ensure that if there is a similar situation this year, that our assessment growth exceeds the increase in the education levy, that we have an opportunity to consider different options for how we could use this education tax room. Given that our tax levy increase is higher this year, we may very reasonably choose to credit this back to the overall tax pool and reduce the amount of funds we collect, but we might also want to use it to address, let's say, the wind-up of regional transit or other emerging priorities. The important thing I want to stress um, is that exploring the education tax room, um, there would be absolutely no increase to the expected out-of-pocket property tax expense to residents. Um, what this motion does allow us to do is have an opportunity to consider how we might want to use our collective resources to best serve all Edmontonians. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Just a question on the timing. Uh, this is probably to Stacey, right? Because you will bring forward the uh, the spring soba, and uh, is 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 this information? I mean, is this workable man work manageable? for that part of their work? It is. Okay, good, all right. Okay, uh, any questions? Seeing none, probably, I'm oh, sorry. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Um, so, because this motion actually provided the direction to give the portion of the assessment growth for the tax, and invest to the housing climate change. So my question is about, um, first to administration, do you have the estimated data of what type of growth could be? Like how much amount could be? So maybe I'm gonna start before we answer that question because I just wanna clarify that what I think this motion is doing is should there be Edu what we call education tax room. So should should the requisition be lower that that is the room that would be dedicated? So it's not about assessment growth, it's about education room possibly becoming available, right? 
That's correct. And I'll just look yeah. to Kate Watt, who's on the line. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm Stacy. Yeah, because yeah, I. My understanding okay. of the way this motion is written is not about growth. It is about a concept called education tax room. And that's what we would be returning to council with an exploration of what that is and, and what council may or may not wish to do as consequence. Okay, then then next question is related. Um, and then under OP12, we have $240 million actually specifically looking at uh, for administration to looking for that amount of money to transfer and to focus on uh, the council's priorities, um, including housing, climate change, and other program. Is this repeat of that work and what's the distinguish between this and that i know that i know this is a wording right now is a little bit from or uh, different from original wording and then right now this wording changes the education tax room instead of the growth uh, assessment goals i i'm a little bit confusing for that and because i thought we already have Two hundred forty million dollars to focus on the council's priorities, including housing and climate change. And this is add additional. So maybe that would be a clarif clarification okay, from sure. the mover. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and I apologize for my misuse of assessment growth, education tax room. Um, my understanding, and, and would look to administration to, to correct or clarify, the two hundred forty million reallocation is really looking at our our base budget. Um, so finding the 240 million within our existing base budget. Our education tax room is, and again, administration can correct my characterization of this, but it's it's somewhat like a different funding source-ish. It wouldn't, it's not currently part of the base. It, yeah. It's a municipal tax levy that moves into the room created when the education requisition is lower than we anticipated when we set the budget. I would definitely see, including this as part of the 240 million when it when it works. So, I, I mean, I appreciate the motion because I see it as a council generated idea that we could use a part of to to do the 240. Yeah. Okay. So I would count it within the 240. You would include it and as then, an option so for council for sure. Yeah. So then, is it is it helpful or is it redundant? It, it is helpful because I'm not sure I would have gone down this road. So I'm, I'm in this case, I think it's good, and we'll. Uh, but, but I think you would see us sort of examine this as part of, because I think it's helpful because it is specific to the spring SOBA, because it'll happen or not happen. But I th also think it's helpful, you know, when we see what happens this spring, we might see that as a future use of uh, of this uh, for the next four years as well, when, it, when it's available. In the same way that I'm probably going to present ideas on how we would use different dividends. So. Uh, in that case, I, I still have a, a few seconds left for specifically this education tax room and in the past and how we how did we use this type of money and because this time and specifically direct that way and in the past and how did we use this money as a usual That will be part Sorry, of the report. Yeah. Uh, Kate Watt speaking. I, I think that that is what the motion is specifically asking us to do, which is to come back to council with an exploration <laughs> and an explanation of how tax room uh, has been talked about and used in the past. I, yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't hear it clearly. What's the answer? And the answer was that this report will provide that information. How. In the past, education tax room has been used by the city. That was the answer I understood to be. Yeah. Okay. Is that right, Kate? Can nod your head. Okay. All right. Here you go. Uh, okay. Councilor Rutherford. I I don't have too many questions. It sounds like from the city manager, it, it does help. But I just I guess, wouldn't this naturally be something that comes back at Spring Soba, anyway? Like we would have the opportunity then to say, you know, this is the reduction in the tax levy based on this uh, education tax room being freed up, blah, blah, blah. 
we'd rather use it and then we could direct you then. Like I just, I'm, I'm, I'm confused about from a process perspective, like why we can't already just do this at spring supplemental budget. We often do this at the spring supplemental budget. If there was, per, like what, what this will do is we'll give you a bit more of the history Okay. Because we won't know until spring if there is education tax room or not. Did I get that correct, Kate? Yes, I, I would interpret this as asking what education tax room is and frankly whether or not it, it does exist. And I think there is an interesting discussion that we could have based on the way this motion has been uh, written as to what tax room is or is not, and whether or not it's reasonable for a municipal council to increase their tax levy as a consequence. So Without, we don't make these assumptions, just yeah. to be clear. When we come forward in the spring supplemental, we do not make the assumption that you would ever want to move into the room if the room exists. Yeah, no, I, I get that. I'm just, I also then wonder, is the spring supplemental budget adjustment the place, like if we're going to have a fulsome conversation as was described by Ms. Watt, would it be better to come to committee to the mover prior to the su spring supplemental budget? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I, I don't know that there's time for that. I, I, like that would be for administration. But it's just that again, in in the last SOBA, there there was not a pre presentation of options or or it was just uh, you know presented as you know again the assumption that we're not moving into the tax room. So it was just to ensure that we don't come to that that same situation again for this SOBA. If there was time before the SOBA, I could see that being of value. But again, not sure on the timelines. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's the, all my questions. The education acquisition may not be decided as early for a report to be generated. No, that's fair. Yeah. I Got appreciate it. it. Thank Got you. It. That's all my questions. Okay, all right. So that concludes the questions. Now to speak. Anyone to speak? Okay, Councillor Nack to speak. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sovey. Uh, so I'll, I'll support it just with, uh, I'm going to put my, my caution flag up early on this because for me, um, up until year X, and we'll get that into history, it was probably 2016, 17, we used to go into this education tax room and we stopped doing it uh, at a certain point in part because it felt speaking solely for myself, a, a tad disingenuous uh, when it came to how we uh, talk about property taxes because when the province, when essentially there was education tax room, we then increased our spending. But, but technically that means we increased our property taxes more than what we approved in December, mm -hmm. which if we're fine with, we should just frankly be saying it and say this is it versus sort of sneaking it, it in underneath this, this illusion that there's, there's money there. And similarly, when the province asks for more than what we originally budgeted for, um, because we were using it in the past, I, I felt it was hard for me to frankly blame them for putting on a large new cost to Edmontonians when we were using it in the good days but not using it in the bad days. So I, I think it's worth having the conversation because I don't think we've had this in a long time and I, I think the history would be, would be valuable, but just so there's no hidden, uh, or, or surprise, it would be unlikely I would support a change from the current process because I think this is the most transparent process. Um, and, and there is a broader issue about provincial funding for municipalities that I think needs to be resolved through things like the local government fiscal framework uh, conversation. And there are groups like Alberta municipalities that are doing work on that right now versus, versus this, which can create just some maybe incorrect assumptions about where we're at. I mean, we shouldn't have an education, pro there, there's a whole bigger philosophical issue. There should, we shouldn't be collecting education property taxes and anti anti uh, an old way of doing things. The money doesn't go to the school boards, it goes into general revenues. So it's just this old thing of that's existed for years and years and years and it creates, and people think that we're taking that money, but that's a separate problem. <laughs> 
And so, but anything that we do that might confuse that I think uh, continues to maybe undermine the desire to change that system going forward. So I'll support this because I think it's good information. Just note that I probably won't support any changes when it comes back. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Now, Councillor Rice. Um, so uh, for the first point, uh, I'm same as uh, Councillor Nack. Yes, uh, we need to look at some information. And um, uh, however, from financial planning perspective, and specifically if you look at the tax increase and for the next four years, um, how we have some additional money we can set aside and to do the better planning and to address some unprotected expenditures come in in the next four years. We may not know at this moment. Rather to give a specific direction, say, for the approach to fund the strategic priorities area, and then plus they, those area already being looked after under that $240 million. Um, I rather just as the motion is really general for the information, how we use this education tax room in the past and what the option could be used in the future and, and to address any financial emergency condition and for our city to face. So from that perspective, I think this is too specific and also repeat that effort and for the $240 million to focus on our strategic priorities. And this is a repeat effort. And so for this reason, and then I, I, I know I lost the opportunity to do amendments earlier, but right now, and because I didn't have that opportunity to do the amendment, so I cannot support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson to close. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm already finding this conversation very interesting, so so look forward to, to even more, uh, hopefully if, if approved when the report comes back. Um, I, you know, I appreciate Councillor Rice's point, and I, I do hope that administration interprets other programs as, as broadly as possible. It's certainly not meant to be... Um, meant to be prescriptive in that way and I, you know I personally would, would really welcome other suggestions and again sort of addressing that idea of resiliency and, and uh, um, addressing unexpected expenses that we might might face but thank you again thanks to administration for their help crafting this motion and uh, I hope you will all support okay please vote We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we will be back at 3.45 with 10.11, Edmonton Valley Zoo. Councillor Tank.
We are live from City Hall Chamber. All right, we are back and we'll do a roll call. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Bay. Hello. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang will be coming shortly. Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Councillor Salvador. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Here. And Councillor Jens had to leave to a uh, uh, for a family reason. All right, uh, Councillor Tang is here. We were on 10.11, Edmonton Valley Zoo. Zoo. Councillor Tang. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to restate the motion to clarify intent here uh, that administration prepare a report for the Community and Public Services Committee that explores opportunities to reduce Edmonton Valley Zoo's reliance on tax levy to support ongoing operation and capital improvements at the zoo for due date November 27th, 2023. Second. So that was, sec so that was second by Councillor Paquette. All right, can you please make the introduction, Councillor Tang? Yes. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, obviously we know that zoo is uh, a beloved. Um, uh, place uh, in Edmonton. I know that you know we, as a family, we love going there, and we've heard a lot of support uh, in our day to day, but also through the budget. Um, there was also a lot of questions raised during the budget uh, in terms of uh, cost, in terms of decision making and governance, uh, and we also got a glimpse of how other municipalities handle assets of this kind. By and large, this is not a typical line of business that most municipalities are in directly. I am interested in follow, following up on this conversation. I think it's time for us in Edmonton to recognize this and see if there are other options out there we haven't considered. Options that also might be more successful and be a better way to improve the zoo. Options that include governance alternatives where decisions are not coming through council to determine the management of the zoo or the fate of animals. You know, I'm thinking Calgary Zoo uh, or you know, structures like um, the Fort Edmonton Park. Some of these organizations, when at arm's length, have more success, for example, with fundraising. So I'd like to explore this conversation further, and I believe this is an opportunity for us to think beyond the zoo as a city asset for us to run. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Questions, colleagues? Seeing none, uh, to speak. To speak. All right. I see no one. I was just to hear you. Okay, Councillor Tang to close. Nothing further. Okay, please vote. We're just waiting on one vote. Councillor Stevenson. I am a yes. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now we go to 10.12, Active Transportation Infrastructure Projects, Councillor Tang. Yes. Um, can we have it pulled up? Yes. Thank you. Uh, that administration provided a memo outlining all active transportation infrastructure projects that are planned for implementation as part of the 2023-2026 capital budget. Second. Second by Councillor Wright. And I don't see the due date. If could, we could figure that out, please. Uh, Councillor Tank, in the meantime, please make the introduction. Uh, Mr. Mayor, that is for a memo, I believe. Is so it a, oh. no, no due date needed. Okay, yeah, here's a memo, yeah, right. okay, good. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this motion is really to support the piece around accountability. Um, you know, obviously, during the budget, we, I mean, or really during, I think, any uh, reporting or council discussion when it comes to outdoor transportation, it tends to be extremely polarizing. And, you know, I think, by and large, this council is very supportive of multimodal uh, transportation networks around the city. I think the outstanding piece, uh, you know, on some of our votes is, um, you know, what what is the rollout plan? Uh, I think in, in this case, specifically the bike plan, what are some of the next milestones are for different projects? Um, and the goal here is to also mitigate some of the concerns around rollout that were expressed during the project. This uh, memo doesn't, um, is not specific to the bike plan uh, because I also want to highlight the fact that uh, when we think about, um, when we think about, you know, infrastructure and transportation, um, the way of the future is 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 multi-use and, and, and multimodal. So a lot of these kinds of work uh, is already embedding a lot of our infrastructure design and build. This is how we should be building cities. So it's not a new thing we're doing, but another um, mechanism to show how our city grows in a progressive way. Um, so I think this is for better knowledge, better awareness for all of us. Um, to, I think, better understand this really critical piece of infrastructure that we are building. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Tang. So who seconded that? Sorry, Councilor Wright, you seconded that, right? Okay, please. Uh, Councilor Cartmel, go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah, I, just one question to administration. I'm wondering if that could include um, alternative transportation uh, and bike plan projects that are embedded in other infrastructure projects, other roadway projects. So we get, you know, essentially a true understanding of all of the things we're doing in support of the bike plan. That was going to be our approach, Councillor Cartmel. Okay, that's my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So, so what I heard the memo is a uh, really demonstrate accountability piece, and do how we use this memo's information to refract that accountability piece and to the mover, the question. Can you repeat the question, please? How we use my MO and to refract the accountability? And well, I believe the, that as council members, the more aware and knowledgeable we are about how some of the, these infrastructure are rolled out, uh, we help to depolarize public conversation around these topics, uh, and we can have a better way of communicating back to our constituents. Uh, is that work already planned uh, under and the city's work, or do we need this direction to get this MIMO? Because you need the MIMO come out automatically without any uh, motion. Not always, and this is uh, under advice from um, from administration. If you want to add anything, so yeah, we wouldn't necessarily provide a memo like this unless council asked for it. Okay, thank, thank you for that clarification. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. So that concludes the questions on this item. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Tang to close. I'm good, thank you. All right, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Next, Arts Habitat, 10.14, Initiatives in Progress, Councilor Tang. Thank you. Uh, so that administration engaged with Arts Habitat and provided a report annually highlighting initiatives and progress on the deliverables and outcomes in the service agreement. Need a Second. seconder, Councillor uh, Principe, right? Councillor Principe, seconder that. Please make the introduction, Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is not too different from an earlier motion around an annual report. Um, so there, during the budget, there were a number of requests for arts habitat, whether as a standalone or embedded. Um, yeah, I feel I felt it was it's an organization uh, and it's work that a few of us are very familiar with. Uh, or with what they have accomplished in the past while, which admittedly has been significantly challenged by, uh, by the pandemic. Um, you know, there are some significant outcomes in this service agreement to move forward with the connections and exchanges 
our strategic plan, uh, including the cultural infrastructure plan, um, and there's other new undertakings like Watona, et cetera, uh, funded through the budget. And so again, you know, that accountability piece, um, uh, I would really like to see how, how you know, we're seeing how the, f the funding dollars are received. We can, for better understanding of the progress on deliverables and outcomes, um, and to make sure you know, we're getting the outcomes that, that, that we've discussed and demonstrating a tangible return on investment. Okay. And the due date is third quarter 2024. Uh, any questions, colleagues? Seeing none, Councilor Tang, you want to close? Good. Please vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And next one is GEF Seniors Housing. That's me. Uh, Madam, uh, City Clerk, do you have the wording for that? Uh, in the in with you, right? Okay, so I'll pass the chair on to uh, Councilor Cartmel. I have the chair. Okay, and if you don't, oh, sorry, I'll ask Clerk to if you have that. Would you like us to put us put it up? Yeah, please. Okay, yeah. we'll do that. Oh, sorry, it's already up. Here we go. That administration work with GEF Seniors Housing to provide annual financial reporting to committee including all deficits and year-end variances. Second. Okay. Just to quickly introduce, this is about, uh, you know, we are obligated under the provincial regulations to uh, make up for any deficit of the GEF. And sometimes we don't find out until the last minute. So this allows us to kind of better prepare and allow GEF to uh, report on that so we can build that into our overall budget plan whenever if there's a deficit and also allows us to better understand the trend in, uh, in that, possibly maybe do some advocacy around, uh, around, around provincial, provincial government. So that's the intent, basically getting that information earlier on as part of the, uh, the report and then we can plan for it. That's it. Oh, sorry. Any questions from anyone? Not seeing any. Anyone speaking to it? Uh, Mayor Sohit, close. No, that's it. Thank you. Uh, please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Thank you. Return the chair. Thank you, Councilor Cartmel. Uh, next one is 10.17, reach admin 2023-2026 operating expenditure budget. Councilor Rutherford. Okay, I will read this in that the REACH Edmonton 2023 to 2026 operating expenditure budget be increased to fund the REACH Neighborhood Organizing Initiative service package as outlined on page 229 in attachment 2 of the November 14th, 2022 Financial and Corporate Services Report FCS 01394 with the following changes by uh, 350,000 beginning in 2023 and ending in 2026 on a multi-year basis with cash flows uh, with funding from the Community Safety and Wellbeing Fund held within financial strategies. Okay, need a seconder? Second. Councillor Tang seconded that. Can you make the introduction, please? Yeah, so I actually had this amendment on the floor uh, at budget debate and I withdrew it um, when there was no funding left available in the Community Safety and Wellbeing Fund. However, subsequent decisions after that withdrawal 
have have opened up space within that fund and I think this is a clear example of the work of reach of doing community safety the neighborhood organizing teams can can work with any neighborhood any community groups that have safety concerns to try to find community-based solutions to help address their safety concerns and I think it's it just really aligns well and and I think reach is a valuable partner in the community safety ecosystem so welcome any questions uh, about this a motion on the floor thank you thank you councillor Rutherford questions colleagues Councillor Cartmel, can you take sorry Councillor Rice go ahead please Yes, thank you, Councillor Rutherford, for bringing this. Community safety is a, one of the most important priority for our city. Um, just to administration, and do we have annual report and for all the initiatives and outcomes and come from the rich and in the past years with the funding we provided? Sorry, the question is to administration. administration. I, yeah, I said very clear. Is anyone on the line that can respond? I might have to get back to you on that. Uh, for me to ask that question, I do want to understand, and based on the past reports and the demonstrate that's that needs, and for this additional one point two million dollars. I know those are very specific questions <laughs> that administrations usually is not prepared to answer because of the such as detailed information required. Maybe that could be provided as part of the information, right, as part of this. And then because this is a funding decision, we do need to understand and in the past with the funding city provided, it achieved the outcome as expected and we can increase that. Yeah, maybe Mover can answer that. Uh, answer that. I think this uh, is the my first question problem. specific to the administration. I so I will have I will have different questions to the Mover. So oh. when I look online, uh, Reach Thank does you. have their 2022 business plan available, their 2021 business plan report back, and their 2021 annual report, and they have those reports from uh, 20, 2009 onward. So those uh, are available. And, and I would say that we have routine conversations with the leadership at, at REACH about uh, what we're achieving together. So I, I do believe there's some uh, understanding of achieving goals and collaboration on achieving those goals and reporting back. So for this additional $1.2 million, what specific for? Maybe this question, Mover can help to answer. Thank you. Yeah, so well, to your first part of your question, REACH has been doing this work. It started with a request from Scott McKean, Councillor McKean, uh, in the Macaulay area. And since then, has ha REACH has had several other councillors and community leaders request the same sort of work. And so they've assumed that cost within their operating dollars. But in conversations and can increased demands on community safety can no longer keep doing that. So that's the impetus is for this. So this community organizing initiative uh, is really around finding partnerships and ways to strengthen the, abil the ability of local grassroots groups to address their safety concerns. So they bring people that have safety concerns in a specific geographical area or even a demographic uh, area and, and bring them together to discuss their safety concerns and find ways that they can collectively address them. Uh, I think it's proven success. Macaulay, uh, Safer Macaulay Project is a good example of that. And I, I know there are many neighborhoods in my ward that could specifically be benefit, but also right now there's projects in North Ganolora, Alberta Avenue, Baldwin, and Beverly as well. Uh, is this $1.2 million for um, specific operating uh, cost or the, for the specific grant or program services? Yeah, it's it's to reflect the operating costs in order to have staff to do the convening and to scale this 
this up and do this with more communities. So this is specific for operating cost? That is correct. And then how many staff and additional staff is under this cost? I don't have the service. This was in the service package as presented on page 229. So I don't have that service package, unfortunately, in front of me right now, but uh, I would suggest referencing that. Okay, I think I think my time is out. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, I don't don't have enough time to answer uh, to answer other questions. Okay, Councillor Principe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do we know other administration or the mover how much Edmonton, the city, contributes to reach each year? I think it's about a million dollars. No, it's it's more than that. We have our the base amount, which didn't increase this year. There was four service packages. Oh, yeah. That t one which was partially funded and the other three remained unfunded, which is one I'm bringing back now, the neighborhood organizing. But they do receive base funding that was continued, but there was no change. So I would have to turn to administration for a reminder on what that base funding is for REACH annually. Thank you, Councillor. I'm currently looking for that. I will get back to you ASAP. Okay, thank you for checking into that. And then do they receive funding from other levels of government? Like is this funding that would be used to leverage other funding sources? Yes, REACH does often get funding. So for and a good example is they received funding related to the um, gun violence uh, initiative. So they're working on some of the gun violence stuff from the federal government. So they do absolutely uh, receive grants and funding from other orders of government and oftentimes in partnership and also as an example with this neighborhood organizing can help be that umbrella organization for those community groups especially if they're not formalized to do a project or initiative with funding coming through through reach okay but not necessarily for this specific package funding from other levels Th of government. There was, no, there was no identification in this service package about, you know, if, if, the, if we provide this money, other orders will match it. There was nothing like that. Right, okay. Um, all right, thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Councillor Cartmel, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you. So. Uh, this is to administration. The I just want to understand the the purpose of uh, the community safety well-being funding is to reduce pressure on policing, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and have other alternative ways of looking at community safety and well-being. So this initiative, the neighborhood organizing initiative, um, can you touch on that? Like, does would does it reduce some of the pressures on policing uh, and help us, does that fit into the uh, into the funding? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely believe, Mayor, that it fits in with the, you know, some of the uh, goals we're trying to achieve through the CSWB strategy and yeah. some of the specific pillars. I would say this actually addresses more than just one pillar, um, and I think it would be very helpful to both police and, and ourselves and the community. So yes, yeah, I, yeah, I think it, this is not one of those ones that is a stretch, I would say. Yeah, it falls cause, in nicely. Yeah, because yeah, the, I, the whole idea, if I understand, like I, my understanding of this program is to more look into community-based solutions to uh, community safety and well-being, because every neighborhood needs are different, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. it's yeah. grassroots and it's from the community. Yeah. And so yeah, I see it. It involves community and all this kind of raises the awareness of the community overall about challenges around social issues and the implication of that onto social disorder. Yeah, and that in itself uh, can definitely result in a reduction yeah. on police requirements yeah. to Got fill it. that void sometimes. So, okay, yeah. good. That's how I understood this program to be good. Thank you so much. And I will take the chair back. Return the chair. And I'll go to Councillor Tang. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very supportive of this program and um, uh, for all the reasons that, you know, the, the comments that we just heard. Uh, but I, I am curious about, um, maybe to the mover first, are you aware if REACH has ever applied through the CSWB grants um, for this particular initiative, given such alignment with the framework? 
Yeah. I, I don't believe they have, it, but it, I, I wouldn't be able to speak to the, the why behind that. Um, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Um, I mean, part of my understanding is that this doesn't qualify for the grant, and I, I think I was just wondering, if, can you get a better sense of why um, this wouldn't qualify for a grant? I'm okay with a with a motion as is, but I'm more just curious. I don't think it's a matter of not qualifying for a grant. It, it was like the grants were very oversubscribed, and and of course, part of the review of those grants was looking at other base funding pieces and everything. So, I don't think there's oh, a see. discrepancy with that. Okay, and then those grants are oftentimes for one time, not necessarily multi-year. Yes, well, certainly every year we'll do those grants, but certainly in, in and I don't know if, if there was a specific grant for this, but, but um, uh, there would be other opportunities, but I, I think in this case this makes sense using and directing the funds directly there. And, and I think that from Reach's perspective, they understood the process to be that there was the, the budget and that they could submit service packages, so they felt mm -hmm that that was more appropriate given their relationship with the, the, the city of Edmonton. Yeah, so. I would agree, yeah. And um, I guess finally, um, to Ms. Freeman or, sorry, to Stacy. <laughs> um, during the submission, did you get a sense of how many neighborhoods that, that, you know, sort of this boost in funding could help to support? Was there a target? Uh, so in my conversations with REACH, I, I don't think there, there is a specific target uh, in place. Uh, this funding, uh, from my understanding, would help support some of the work that is already going, that they've sort of reallocated, that they had previously reallocated resources right. towards to support. Um, but also I, I do know that they have flexibility, and should there be other neighbourhoods where uh, there are specific uh, and acute needs, uh, they're certainly open to the conversations and supporting that, those as well through uh, this, this funding mechanism. Great, thank you. And I'll just add to that. I think another sort of help, helpful part is, um, you know, the the where we where we apply the resources from HSOC are we're done, and then we work with Reach on those as well. So there's a continual dialogue, I would say, between organizations like Reach and us in terms of where the need is. Sorry, sorry. Can you just clarify that? Well, the, uh, if needs arise from HSOC, you yeah, will work with a neighborhood group that this program will be. Sorry. Is, yeah, my point, Councillor, was that was that we're we're always talking to Reach about you know when something happens in HSOC and mm -hmm. we surge in a place that might have a different impact on a community, for example. So we're always sort of comparing notes about how we operate on HSOC um, and other things. So it, it just helps. Uh, I, what I'm trying to point out is that they they're aware of what our operations are. We're working together with them on that, so that helps target which communities they can use these funds to help. Great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Paquette. Just to speak. To speak. Councillor, uh, so can you move the second round, Councillor Paquette? I would prefer not to. I'll Some move it. Okay, oh. Councillor, <laughs> Councillor uh, Nacht moved it. Councillor Principe seconded that. Please vote. I'm opposed. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Did it, it didn't come up for you. I'm in favor. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, so for funding source and um, right now and then is use our community safety and well-being funding. So how many, how much available funding still available remaining in this funding source? So for 2023, 2.9 million. Okay. For 2024, 2 million. And for 2020, 
$4.7 million each year. So we still have uh, lots of money left and in this funding source. And then also for the criteria for anybody and uh, use this funding source is only for the program or, pro or services or they can use for the operating cost. Sorry, are you asking? Uh, ask like this would be eligibility and for this funding to to be used. So, on the basis of everything that's been approved so far, um, in general, council has allocated it to initiatives, like certain specific projects or programs that have a community safety and well-being being tie, and also. Uh, they can use for the operating cost? I guess I'm unclear what you mean when you say they can use it for the operating cost. Uh, for example, this request right now is for the operating. And I just want to understand that the funding is used for the program services project or also can be covered for the operating cost. Well, so I think this would be the operating costs associated with the neighborhood organizing initiative as outlined on page 229 of the budget. Uh, so then my next question, if we approve this, and then is the rich item on still, um, still eligible to apply for the remaining funding for other type of programs and services? Yeah, I believe so. I don't think there's anything that would prevent them from. Okay, so, for more. Yeah. so info approved for this operating cost, they're still eligible for that. Okay, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. But they won't be able to apply to fund this program, right? It will be another program, right? That's, I think, clarity is important. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because they have other programs that they run. They won't be able to double dip into if yeah. they get this funding, they cannot get grant funding to run the same program. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I, don't yeah, think right. they would, I also don't think they would apply. No, I know. Yeah. I think if that clarity is Sorry, important. I trying to. Yeah. I don't think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay. All right. So that concludes the questions. Uh, to speak, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to speak in favor of this motion. Uh, for a very simple reason that I have availed myself of the services of reach for my ward in an intense conversation about community safety and well-being. And it actually uh, led to some really great results and really great communications. And, uh, you know, at, at the table were community members, it was reach, it was uh, Edmonton uh, uh, police services. Uh, there are uh, members of administration. It was actually a really excellent uh, community conversation. And uh, it wasn't cheap either because it was over a period of three Saturdays. And uh, um, we did a lot of uh, outreach for that, a lot of promotion. And uh, I think it really helped to educate a lot of people in the community about the issues, uh, about what the challenges are, but also empowering them. Uh, and uh, so if this money here helps other uh, board councillors to do uh, similar programs and similar outreach to their community, I think that can only be a good thing. Now, there is, uh, you know, something to be said about the fact that, um, you know, we would want to see our helping organizations become more aligned on how we do these things so that we can get, you know, a little bit more efficient bang for our buck. But on the other hand, I, I think I do want to mention, especially uh, in items like these, that we will debate for a very long time on matters of $100,000, $350,000, which of course we should debate every single penny, but we seem to put far more emphasis on debating the pennies than we do the dollars, which I find uh, very interesting and maybe something we can consider as a group going forward. Well, at least I will consider it. I can't suggest anything or prescribe anything for council. Uh, but having said that, I do urge council to support this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Paquette, Councilor Tang. Great, thank you so much. Um, I guess sort of similar to Councilor Paquette, I wanted to take this opportunity to actually thank the REACH team, the neighborhood team. 
um, there are uh, two projects happening uh, in War Gutter Hill, and uh, and I feel without this, without the current resource, which I find, it, you know, I, which I recognize is to be quite limited, um, I don't think some of these projects and conversations would have gotten the momentum um, and the attention uh, in the neighborhoods uh, that uh, it did. So I find. Uh, so I just want to take the moment to thank them. Uh, you know, they have been connecting, they have been taking a lot of initiatives. Um, and, you know, when we come together and similarly through a series of meetings and conversations uh, with neighbors, with local organizations, uh, with EPS and various stakeholders, it's a systems coordination in a microcosm. And, um, and I know oftentimes agencies often get blamed for not coordinating enough, but I actually think th this is a really good example of uh, systems coordination in action a bit. Um, and I also really appreciate the, you know, this fundamental principle around community care and that as neighbors, we also have power um, and capacity and we need to facilitate that, we need to develop that um, to support um, community well-being and safety. And I very much uh, appreciate the, the fact that an initiative like this shifts the narrative about what safety means. Um, because I think too often in this room, we have a very singular definition of safety um, and we focus on a very singular uh, solution, often around enforcement, and I think this, um, what this initiative does is that opens up a lot of other possibilities. Um, one of the two projects right now has kind of wrapped up, you know, I recognize for something to be long-term and sustainable, it needs um, uh, massive community support, um, but I also think uh, maybe that's okay, maybe uh, you know, an initiative like this is really there to, to facilitate sometimes in the moment, maybe sometimes longer, maybe not. It really depends on the capacity and the interest and the, um, of, of the neighborhoods. But I've, I've, I know, you know, me and my office have really appreciated their, uh, their involvement and collaboration. Um, and we, you know, we, and I hope, you know, other counselors and other wards and other neighborhoods where safety is top of mind, which I think it is for across the city, um, that we really begin to engage in this different kind of conversation and relationships with um, our neighbors uh, through this way. So thank you for bringing this motion forward. Thank you, Councilor Tang. Councilor Rice? I, I would like to start say community safety matters to every Edmontonians and who live in the city. And specifically matters for some like high risk areas. And I really appreciate and we have the organization like Reach Edmonton and doing such organization and then community based work and to support our community safety. I think no doubt for that at all. For this specific moment right now, I think there are many questions and from our community and also from our Edmontonians come back to ask us and how we can ensure every dollars we invested and in certain program and services and we, we do see the outcome. And we do see the outcome actually positive impact the concerns and address the concerns and then impact how our public feel and specific for the community safety. And this is reflected in my questions. That is why I ask financial questions. That is why I ask outcome impact questions because I really want to ensure and that every decision our council made to invest the money, we can get the outcome as the public expected. And then it's not about we don't support community safety, we do support. And specifically, we do support community based and solutions. And then this type of conversation, I believe already happened many years. How could we find the cost effective and also efficient way to really work on the community-based organization and also community-based solution to address community safety. And then I'm going to support this motion. 
and at the same time, I look, and then I'm going to support this motion. And at the same time, I'm looking forward this organization can extend their capacity and then even from their scope covering to cross more communities, not only certain communities and across the entire city and then to demonstrate and to our public and every community we will have the organization like Rich Edmonton to support us to build that community best solution to address our community safety. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I just, again, when discussing systems change and addressing safety, the Breaches Neighborhood Organizing Initiative is to me an example of how we can address safety and well being through collaboration and through the lens and expertise of unique community needs and solutions to those, to those needs. In 2022, the Neighborhood Organizing Initiative underwent an evaluation where they highlighted that the, the value that they brought forward, um, and this is from the words of other community members, and we heard from some of the colleagues that have had experiences in their wards, is that is the ability to conduct multifaceted community engagement to understand the root causes of safety concerns and to collect insights in a community safety report that is used to align responses and reduce duplication, maximize re resources and foster collaboration. By convening stakeholders, they are able to align community efforts and um, make sure that diverse community groups like leagues, business associations, social agencies, cultural groups, et cetera, are all involved in the solutions. To me, this is a direct hit and a, a direct target with the intent um, of the community and something that uh, allows us to feel, and community members to feel, like Councillor Paquette said, empowered in, in often what is an unempowering situation of feeling unsafe. And so I, I really hope that uh, you consider supporting this. I was intentional in doing it for the four years, and I hear the piece around accountability. I sit on the REACH board, and. I'm happy to report back on any expansions and, and outcomes from, from this funding, so I'm happy to do that. But I would also expect that those questions would absolutely be asked on an annual basis as we talk about funding things, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. I am in favor. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Sorry, I'm in favor as well. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So we have one, two, three, four, five, five pending motions. So we have half an hour. Let's see if we can get through. Uh, all right, next one is open spaces amenities in developing neighborhoods. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, so I'll reread this motion. Uh, that, <coughs> that administration provide a report with options and analysis, including conducting stakeholder engagement that explores opportunities for developer contributions to establish open space amenities, including playgrounds in developing neighborhoods. Need a seconder? Second. Councillor Wright, second. Councillor Wright, second to that? Okay, all right. Councillor Rutherford, please make the introduction. Sure, so uh, this actually came out of a few discoveries that I had in the ward about developing greenfield neighborhoods that were promised park spaces by the developer and then no park spaces are there, now it's the city's responsibility. Unfortunately, I had to go back to the community in January and tell them that, I, that the park that they had wanted was not funded in this package, so they're gonna wait even longer, but it brought up a bigger systemic issue to me that I feel needs to be addressed. We consider roads essential infrastructure, we consider sidewalks essential infrastructure, um, and I think playground spaces should be as well, and right now, from my understanding with the process, it's really left up to the developer's discretion what, if any, amenities they put in, and it's creating inequity 
across greenfield development. Um, my understanding in talking with city administration is that most do, but then some don't. So my question is, and the report would generate, um, you know, how do we make this a standardized thing as essential as a road is having a playground structure in each neighborhood uh, rather than, you know, when the property, the park space gets turned over and then we communities wait 10 plus years to have a playground structure in their, in their neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rutherford, we okay, Councillor Paquette, then Councillor Stevenson, then Councillor Wright. Councillor Paquette. Okay, just Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I was about to say, before I saw more names pop up, that I think that this is self-explanatory. We can have an excellent conversation when the report comes back, so let's go to vote. And I was going to call the question, but... I, okay, Stu, yes, I'll leave I, it at that. Yes, yeah, so you have spoken. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor, Steven, Councillor Wright, to, to uh, question or speak? Quick question. Go ahead, please. Would this report also include sort of ongoing operational costs to the city? Can I? To the mover or to the administration? Maybe to the mover uh, to first? To the mover? Yeah. Your intent was no. No, my, <laughs> okay. intent, my intent is that by creating standards and expectations, because right now what happens is developers can basically, because it's at their discretion, do really elaborate playgrounds or small playgrounds, and we are responsible for any of those operating costs. This would actually standardize that a bit, I think, actually. Okay, and the then intent that, of the motion. And that would then control what operational costs it would be going forward? Exactly. Would that be included in the report, yes? Uh, administration? If, we would include any operating costs that would be applicable, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Councillor Tang. Yeah, I have, I have um, you know, first of all, I, I didn't know that this was not a standard policy, so I'm, I'm glad to see that it is a standard, or, or the intent here is to standardize this and embed it as a policy for those contribution amenities. Um, at first, I wanted just to the mover. So your intent is, um, it is not just any amenity, it is this playground across the board, right? I... I think that a playground structure in each neighborhood to me is essential. Um, and right now we don't have that. So that is the, I wanted this to be very focused so that it didn't get diluted. I know, you know, we can talk about dog parks and other things as well, but I, I felt like when we're enticing and encouraging new families to move into areas, this to me is, is an essential piece of, of infrastructure in, in neighborhood gathering, in exercise, in, in, in well-being. Yeah, I think that is helpful. Um, maybe I'll just, I mean, if there's nobody else for questions. Um, uh, no more questions, Councillor Tang, you done, Constance? I, I was gonna speak to it. Okay, okay, can you speak? Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, happy to support this. I, I was concerned a little bit around um, sort of the flexibility, um, as I think we've seen today, we've had a number of motions that are, in my opinion, highly prescriptive. Um, you know, in, I guess, in a lot of the neighborhoods in my ward, what we're seeing is um, there's actually, a, there's a market force that's also, that drives attracting families um, or tr attracting different kinds of people to various neighborhoods. And these amenities play a huge role into that, whether it is playground um, and dog parks. Um, what I am also noticing is that when we do have playgrounds, it's meant to attract young families, playgrounds tend to be designed for very young children, but then those children grow up and they actually have, they don't have a whole lot of amenities to, to go to. So I would just simply encourage, um, you know, these kinds of considerations, uh, you know, be, be taken in as the administration is preparing for, for these reports, you know, amenities that, re, that is responsible to the evolving nature of, of neighborhoods um, and the people in them. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Stevenson to speak. Yes, just very briefly to thank the mover for bringing this forward. I think it's, it's a great way um, to advance more complete communities. Uh, you know, I wanna recognize that, you know, as a city, we've done a lot of work to reduce barriers and costs that don't add value to our communities, particularly through our, our permitting processes and, and other, um, or, or our sewer system um, planning. And I, I think that when we are, 
you know, really doing that work to find those savings, uh, find those efficiencies, support housing affordability. It really makes sense to look at, you know, what are the other things that we, we that do add value to the community and, and look to our development partners to support with that work. So thank you, very pleased to support this. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford to close. Uh, just again, I uh, would urge my colleagues to support this just in in speaking to, to Councillor Tang. I, I really do see this as many developers go above and beyond. That's at their discretion, their marketing campaigns. But I think about this almost like universal basic income. What's the, the minimum standard of infrastructure that we have? And I think that that goes into some specifics of what should be in a, that playground structure. So I really look forward to this report in generating this discussion and, and hope my colleagues see the value in that discussion as well. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote. I'm a yes. I'm going to have to reset my e scribe, it looks like. Thank you, Councillor Wright. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Next, bike imp plan implementation and enhanced lighting. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. So the, to read the motion in, that administration provide a report with options within the bike plan implementation approach three funding for enhanced lighting on existing active mode infrastructure to support safety and encourage mode shift. Second. Thank you, Councillor. Paquette, second that. Uh, Councillor uh, Rutherford, please introduce it. Uh, yes, thank you. So, you know, when we talk about a bike plan, we talk really, we're talking about active modes and we're talking about mode shift and giving people more op options. Whether they take a car one day, but then they can bike another. Whether they want to walk somewhere or, or scooter somewhere. And I think about a lot of shared use paths that we currently have, our current existing infrastructure. I asked a question during the written response for the capital budget and about 20% of our current shared use path infrastructure does not have adequate lighting. So when we're talking about a mode shift, I think about even myself as a fairly privileged woman, I would not use a shared use path. And in fact, did when I lived in Inglewood, would not bike downtown to Edmonton Tower when I worked there on the shared use path between Inglewood and um, the brewery district because the lighting was so terrible. And so when we're talking about a mode shift, I feel like we, we can keep building out and out, but it's the same conversation of how are we enhancing what we already have and making sure that its usability functions for, uh, for that mode shift as well. And so that is the, the intent of this motion. And I think, um, you know, we, we've heard a lot of feedback on, on active mode. And I think that this is a really good approach and being able to have a conversation about all of the really progressive and bold moves we're making around the bike strategy while also recognizing what we all already have and improving what we already have. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. I think Councillor Nack, you may have an amendment to this, right? Yeah, to, uh, maybe uh, I'll just ask a quick, yeah. quick question yeah. to, to help inform that. Um, so just to get a better understanding, how do we currently fund, so because we have 20% that isn't adequately lighted, what, what is the funding source and what is the strategy that exists today to, to help address that? Or do we have one? I would suggest that the, the method to address that is when we... Uh, undertake renewal of that infrastructure, that it would be a, an assessment of, of lack of lighting, but not a specific program, I would say, unless Cord has, a, has another thought. Uh, no, uh, Councillor, there is no specific um, uh, dedicated program to improve lighting on, um, so, on active So practice. at the moment, in order to fund that, we would have to like, you know, find funding somewhere because there isn't a currently dedicated source. Correct. It would, okay. again, be addressed as part of uh, when we go into complete renewal, we don't do a like for like, and that would be a, a method that we could address it. But for these locations, I'm not sure any sort of what the plans are from a renewal perspective. Okay, that's helpful. Yes, so, so Mayor so I think the, the amendment I would make is just to strike after options. So I would strike the words within the bike plan implementation approach 
approach three. Yeah, okay. They'll probably be friendly because we're talking about existing infrastructure. Don't you want to be it friendly? Okay, you want to have a second. Okay, or constant. Constant Salvador seconded that so that the. Yeah, I just wouldn't consider it friendly because it changes the principal intent of the original motion. Okay, no worries, no worries. Not a friendly, so we have amendment on the floor which would strike uh, within the bike plan implementation plan or approach three. Okay. And just to. Uh, go, briefly, please go ahead, Constant Neck. Yeah, briefly to introduce it. Um, we might want to use that funding for this, but I don't want to solely prescribe that one funding source for this because honestly if we have a shortage of lighting um, that is, that to me probably requires a different funding source than this this might help us with some interim solutions maybe we want to do it that could be part of the report but um, the funding that we approved is a finite amount of money and if we have a citywide issue that needs to be resolved we need a fixed and permanent source to do that so I just don't want to uh, exclusively use that source which is why I want to strike that so Thank you. No, thank you for that, Councillor Nack. Uh, okay, questions on the amendment now. On the amendment only. Just hold on, please sign up on the amendment. Councillor Nack's amendment. Uh, I'm just waiting for people, the list to appear. And they, and they may be waiting because we need to, I think, post it before the queue goes up. Here we go. Councilor Wright, questions on the amendment? No. Okay. Councilor Salvador, questions on the amendment? Yeah, briefly. Go ahead, please. Um, well, yeah, thank you so much for this amendment. I uh, just need a few points of clarification. So when I look at the funds, uh, and this is to administration, when I look at the funds that were approved during the budget for bike plan implementation, um, I guess my understanding is that administration already has the latitude to upgrade substandard routes using a variety of tools in the bike plan implementation, gliding, in, including lighting, wayfinding, um, beyond sort of the physical infrastructure improvements that would be associated with the active mode infrastructure themselves. Is that is that correct understanding? It's fair, but also um, we need to, based on what was approved by council, confirm what exactly we would be recommending to move forward as part of that. So it may not cover off uh, all locations that councillors desire to have lighting a, a, a fix to. For so sure. Yeah, and that sort of goes back to Councillor Nack's point around having that larger conversation, not specifically tied to bike plan implementation. Yeah, our first step would be to, on the basis of what council approved, uh, how much, in what locations, and using what methods would we build out as much of the network as we could, which includes all of those elements that you mentioned. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, you know what, I think that, that clears it up for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Salvador. Councillor Rice. Um, to administration, this question. Do we, did we already approve the budgets and back to the December and specific for active transportation? That budget is portion of this uh, to achieve the outcome for this motion, like for the lighting improvement. Council Th that approved. That is my remember. Yeah. Council approved um, hundred million dollars to implement the bike plan with an approach that um, uh, allows administration the latitude to land on where and how uh, of the entire network. What I'm looking at with this amendment from the previous motion that was put on the floor was that the reference to the bike plan would be removed from this and it would be a more holistic discussion around lighting as it relates to active transportation locations. Uh, actually, um, I, I don't have that uh, paper on, 
on my hand right now, and then I actually I'm talking about different active transportation uh, funding approved by council. So it's not one hundred million dollars for for bike line, because I remember I asked a question: Is there overlap? And because we back to the budget deliberation, we approved active transportation at separately, and we approved one hundred million dollars for bike line. Yep. So that so is why I I was wondering if this line lighting Im improvement already included in that active transportation program. I can't answer that specific question because in some locations um, it's part of, for example, part of neighborhood renewal. In some locations, it's adding a missing sidewalk link. So the the granularity of does it include lighting or not is still something that we need to confirm. Uh, so in Francis' case, by delete, delete that uh, sentence, does that mean we have to use different funding source to fund this amendment? So it's a report coming back on options. By removing this, uh, I think it's expanding uh, what options are available rather than specifically looking at the funding that was allocated for the bike plan implementation. So you will look at a different funding source? Uh, well, yes. And just say council approved all the capital budget. So I, I, right now, I'm not sure what funding sources we would be recommending other than so uh, we'll, reallocation from other programs. So just reallocation will not impact the final approved budget amount? No, but it would be an adjustment to the capital program, so then it would become a larger conversation. And so. Way, so reallocation from different projects. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rutherford, question on the amendment? Just to speak to the amendment. Just to speak. And Councillor Wright to speak as well. Okay, yeah. Councillor Wright, go ahead, please. Speak. No, it was a question on the oh, you have amendment. On, on the, the oh, sorry, go ahead, no, please. Sorry, not on the not on this amendment, but on the original motion. Oh, so I see. Okay. Oh, I see one. Okay, got it. Councillor Jens to speak. Yeah, very quickly. I think this is really important. If we want, uh, I I think lighting is important, but I think it has to be done through additional funding or different envelopes or different pathways. I think it's really critical if we're going to um, complete the bike network, if we're going to meet our climate goals, if we're going to do. Uh, all of those important objectives that we have, that we're going to need um, all of the resources we can to foster connectivity and to, to up ridership. So um, I would be supportive of uh, seeing um, other other sources and options, but I would not I would not be supportive of uh, um, taking further dollars towards lighting. Lighting is incredibly expensive, and uh, um, we'll need to look at that. So uh, I appreciate certainly the the concern of the mover, but I certainly. Would prefer I, I couldn't support the main motion without this amendment. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I can't support the amendment on the floor. Um, I understand the intent of the amendment on the floor, um, but I also understand the intent of my original motion. And um, as Mr. Lachlan pointed out, like, the report generating without this piece makes it just a report with no action. This allows it some teeth of saying, actually, look at the bike plan implementation, look at those strategic spaces where lighting could really enhance a mode shift. And it's, it's interesting because when I've asked specifically about the scope of the bike plan, lighting was not included. So without this motion, I don't think that lighting would be as explicit um, as, as said. That being said, I don't want lighting to take up 100% of this budget. I think the report back can give us you know, the scope and the scale and we can make a further decision. But I think we have to work with an existing budget and taking this out essentially means the original motion um, generates a report, but a report that will lead to nothing. And, and so I think that losing this is, is huge in the original intent of the emotion. Thank you, Councillor uh, Rutherford. Councillor Knack, uh, sorry, Councillor uh, uh, Cartmel, can you take the chair, please? I have the chair. Thank you so much. I 
I really appreciate Councillor Knack making this amendment because we need to be absolutely clear that the budget we passed for $100 million for bike plan goes toward the bike plan implementation approach three, which we ex discussed extensively uh, leading up to the budget and, uh, and including the budget. Uh, I support Councillor Rutherford's attempt and, uh, uh, and, and desire to have more lighting, which I, I would support uh, if this amendment is passed. Uh, I, you know, I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, $100 million has been debated extensively in the public as well. And we have uh, taken some political hits because of that, right? And uh, I want the political capital I have expended on this, I want that to be implementing this plan. I don't want to compromise that. That's why it's absolutely important that we, we deliver on what we discussed in the, in the, in the budget. Uh, and do not take money away from the bike plan. I would support uh, other funding sources. Absolutely, there'll be opportunity. Because uh, lighting, in my mind, safety and improves safety, improves accessibility, and, and and that's part of the core infrastructure, core core services that we provide. And there'll be opportunity for us to discuss that as part of uh, OP12, right? And uh, I look forward to that conversation. But I think it's absolutely important for us to uh, 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 live up to the expectations that we raised as part of the what we approved under the bike plan implementation. So I would support this, and if this passes, I would support the initial uh, uh, motion of Councillor uh, Rutherford. And I will take the chair back, and I'll go to Councillor Salvador to speak on this. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And <clears throat> just want to thank Councillor Knack for bringing this amendment forward. The bike plan, which was developed with significant public engagement, technical expertise, does make it clear that among uh, various infrastructure upgrades, lighting is important and it does provide benefit for active transportation. Um, and I agree it's a gap, but I also think there are other gaps related to wayfinding, all seasons maintenance, end of trip facilities, bike parking, and most importantly, above those things, protected infrastructure that is safe and creates a viable network that will enable mode shift and ridership. Um, so I'm very supportive of the amendment that Councillor Knacks put forward uh, because I would not have been able to support the original motion. Uh, when I voted for the bike plan implementation as part of budget, I did so with a high degree of confidence in the bike plan itself and the bike plan implementation guide, which we have discussed multiple times at Urban Planning Committee. Um, and if something to the effect of the original motion was included in that budget motion, I'm not sure I would have been able to, to support it at that time either. So uh, to me, going down the road outlined in the initial motion would take one intervention that is part of the bike plan toolkit and place it above ad other interventions um, that could possibly be, be more effective. So uh, fundamentally, I'm afraid that it would really change the parameters that we discussed during budget and uh, the decisions we just made and it would ultimately move us further from that network effect that we're really trying to achieve. So absolutely support the desire for more lighting, uh, but I do not think that this is the correct funding source. Um, so happy to support the amendment, and I'll, I'll only speak once. Uh, so if the amendment is passed, happy to support the original motion as well. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I absolutely support uh, Councillor Rutherford's motion. I also support this amendment because I think it uh, makes the effort a little bit more responsive and it actually opens up more possibilities, which I really appreciate. We're going to have a lot of touch points along the way here. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, opening it up this way makes a lot more sense. I don't think that uh, there's any confusion on administration side about the fact that we need safety features. Um, but how we do it uh, really matters. And uh, we can't just like lock ourselves into uh, one concept of how that will go forward. I understand that the beauty of that is that you lock it in, but um, it may not be the optimal direction. And because this is a journey to get there, uh, there, is a, there are many uh, touch points for us to ensure that optimal direction. And uh, I think it would be wise, uh, at least on my part, I feel it is wise uh, to uh, move forward with this amendment, understanding that this is, uh, this is not 
an endpoint. This is a conversation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pickett. Councillor Nack to close. Yeah, thanks, Mayor Sohi. Um, so I should note, like, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to using some of the, the bike plan funding for lights, to be clear, because I act to, to Councillor Rutherford's point. Um, I, what I don't want this to suggest, like I don't want people to vote for this assuming that, that that's going to be completely off the table because what I do worry about is to, to the point you mentioned earlier, we, we need to fund lighting. Like, and, and if this is a suggestion that um, those areas that currently have good infrastructure won't get lighting because we don't know where that funding will come, come from, that I actually think would be not a positive way forward. There's, there could be some really good trails that, um, might be something we would define as like a priority one uh, body of infrastructure that all it needs is maybe some uh, enhancements, maybe some curb extensions, maybe something that, that brings it up to that standard that we look for. And so there might actually be a case for some of our, our existing corridors to have those upgrades. So for me, I'm, I'm sort of in, in between. You almost convinced me to vote against my own amendment originally because I just, I don't want us to not deal with the 20% because I actually think that's, that could be in limbo for a long time. I think it's still worth pulling it out, which is why I ultimately decided to support my own amendment. Uh, I almost got convinced otherwise. Um, but with a commitment that, that this does not leave that 20% off the table. We need to fund it one way or another. And some of that funding might actually come from the bike plan because it could be a better place. So I'll support this uh, with the intent that no matter what, we need to address what Councilor Rutherford brought up in the first place because that is Thank a you. major issue. Thank you, Councilor Nack. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, now we're back to the original motion as amended, and we have two minutes. Uh, we have consular right questions. Anyone else have any questions on this? Because if there are too many questions, then we have to pause. If not, then uh, we might be able to deal with it. Consular right. Anyone else have any questions on this? No. Okay. Councilor Wright, go ahead, please. Maybe we could, can we extend the order of the day to finish this item? So moved. Thank you, Councilor Nack. Second. Second by Councilor Principe. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Wright. So to administration, would some of those fund funding options that could be considered uh, working with community leagues that want to pay to light pathways? Well, we it, it could be because we actually do have uh, a local improvement process to support lighting. And if a community league was interested in that, that could be a potential option. At okay. this point in time, I'd... Okay. We'd have to write the report. I, I so. know of one that wants to do it. Okay, okay. thank you. That's thank you. I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. So please, uh, uh, okay, anyone to say anything else? Ooh, hi. <laughs> hi, August. How are you? Nice to see you. <laughs> okay, uh, to vote? Call Councillor Rutherford to close or to speak? Okay, who wants to speak? I want to vote. <laughs> no. Okay, Councillor Rice. So, yes, uh, the lighting is a, is a safety issue, and then we have to ensure uh, the safety and for our Edmontonians who use active model and uh, then transportation or um, model transportation. I think that is very important. Um, but I'm not going to support this motion. The reason for that and then uh, bike nine and implementation approaches three and right now is under um, $100 million funding. And then, so they work. 
um, it's my understanding still have involved some design, involved some public engagement, and then for the systematic approach and how we address the related uh, bike line development safety issue. So this lighting is just one piece of that work. I would like to look at that work uh, in the big broad level and instead of right now, we are only focused on the lighting and without knowing the big plan and for this capital project. And then with that reason, and then that's why I said I'm not support. It's very short. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Rutherford to close. Yeah, I would just highlight to my colleague that just spoke that the the specific project was removed, so this is very much more a general uh, report that will talk about, you know, options and opportunities around how we can enhance those lightings in currently existing uh, active mode infrastructure. I really welcome that uh, conversation and that report, and I'm sure it's going to generate a lot of um, uh, interesting insights into where we where we have lighting and even where we don't have lighting uh, across the city. So I'm uh, looking forward to it and, and look forward to the support of council if, okay. if you so desire. Thank you. Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So we have 10.19, sorry, that's done, okay. 10.21, uh, 10.23, uh, and 10.24, three pending motions. Uh, what I would suggest, if it's, uh, if council colleagues are agreeable, that we defer these three pending motions to our next council meeting instead of coming back tomorrow? Is that okay? Right? Because that way we don't have to come back tomorrow just for three items. Is that okay, colleagues? Which will, when will be our next, what day is that? Sorry. February 22nd, February and 20th. if you unanimously agree to adjourn, then you don't need to do anything to those motions pending. They automatically lay over. Okay. Is that okay, colleagues? Is it okay? We can come back tomorrow if people want to come back. No, no, no. Wait. I don't know. So next meeting is February 22nd? Yeah. So one month later, almost, like, okay. Yes, up to you. It's up to everyone. Uh, I'm just I, throwing I, it I out. I, I agree. We don't need to come back. But is that possible to finish tonight? Uh, no, because no. we probably be in a violation of some... Uh, <laughs> I Maybe it... I Because it, it, it takes time. Like if... Andre, you want to say a few words? Well, I'm going to my mother's birthday party, but... Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. okay. we did not no. ask we're, earlier we're, on, so... Uh, administration we have not prepared has, to go beyond yeah, 5 no, we, Okay, so it wouldn't be fair to administration to stay beyond 5. Okay. Well, anyways, no consensus. We'll be back here tomorrow. No, 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 no. no, no. There was consensus. Oh, there was consensus? I said it, yeah. I oh. Said it's okay. oh, there was consensus. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, okay. All right. I said, it, I said it's okay. We don't need to come back tomorrow. Okay, well, then... Uh, uh, we are adjourned. adjourned with the unanimous consent? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Wait a second. <laughs>